дякуємо за авто, підписникам Маркадо у медіа в цей час, воно нам дуже необхідно. Дякуємо глядачам каналу Меркадо Медіа за збір на цю автівку. Слава ЗСУ! Дякую, друзі з НАФО, мій нам є Піт Хастелавіста з Project Constantine. Цей чудовий біст був донатив до бригаду, яку ми знайомі в Форесті, 67 бригаду. 69 снафі бригаду донатив до 67. Це дуже круто. Я кажу на цю автівку в Форесті. Ми не маємо часу, щоб... To actually make any videos or, or get inside your vehicle and, and, and do any missions with it because we just we're like passing ships in the night here. But Mercado Media, Andrew, the you, you NAFO supporters, it's beautiful to see this grand vehicle that you've got for this for this brigade because it's a reliable vehicle and I've never seen it anywhere other than in the forest. I've never seen it in the garage. And yes to that and uh, and all Ukrainians must live. Bakhmut is Ukraine. This forest is Ukraine. Mercado Media and NAFO, you guys are here supporting us, man, and we freaking love you to pieces. Thank you for what you're doing for the soldiers of Ukraine. God bless you. To victory. Do peremohe. We are Marines from the Strike and UAV Company of the 35th Marine Brigade. We kindly ask the NAFO community and the charity fund Help 99 to provide us with the pickup trucks so we could keep effectively execute combat missions. We will be grateful to receive support and help from you. Slava Ukraini! Heroes! All right, everybody, check on in to the stream. How are we doing today on April 9th, 2024? We're live on YouTube. We're live on Facebook. I was fiddling with a new streaming service because we were on OBS for like the last two years of Streamlabs OBS and I'm tired of it. It just continues to drop issues. So I'm on OBS now through a uh, restream. So I was tinkering with it and it took a while. I still have some things I need to adjust and work on. We had to get started tonight. So I hope everything does look good for you guys. It looks great. It appears with this um, setup, I can stream to YouTube in 1440p, which is pretty awesome. So it's a higher quality. I hope Facebook will hold through um, Facebook audience, I am live on YouTube as well. We have an amazing YouTube audience. So tonight, we're going to be going through all the latest within Ukraine and everything around it. Uh, let's hear, let's go through the latest fundraiser that we have. The NAFO 69 Sniffing Brigade. Here it is. $3,429 out of $19,500. Absolutely amazing work, you guys. So far, keep up the absolute amazing work with these donations you guys you guys are killing it doing amazing we've rolled right from the last we're going fundraiser to fundraiser to fundraiser may not be the biggest channel out here might not be the uh, most known channel for ukraine support because i do cover other topics and we go through other events but i would say that we're among the top fundraising consistently platforms on youtube right this is our ninth patch all right, ninth patch, that's like what? That's like about $20,000 per patch, so do the math. And then also the additional two patches, that, or the additional two fundraisers we did for the dog tag campaigns, if you guys have a dog tag campaign. So continue to support Ukraine, get that refinery meltdown NAFO patch, especially, especially that we continue to hear that uh, our government in the United States continues to try to detract Ukraine from attacking these targets, and that's just very serious. They're very silly. Very silly and a serious situation to be limiting Ukraine, but it's for political reasons, right? Uh, United States, we have an election coming up. Uh, it's tough times in the United States when Americans see gas prices go up, right? You can give the reason why. Oh, well, Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia controls a lot of the oil production. You know, they uh, the gas prices are going to go up, and, and it, it's going to happen, and Americans are going to have to deal with that because Ukrainians are fighting for their existence, okay? It'd be very simple to just explain it like that, but with Americans, everybody's an individual. Everybody has their own thing. Everybody's special and uh, has a purpose out here. And we're all individuals in the United States. So it's going to be hard to like convince the United States when gas prices go up to be like, yo, this is because uh, Ukraine's defending themselves against Russia. Russia will just propagandize the situation. The MAGA wing of the Republicans will say, hey, look, gas prices are going up because Joe Biden. That's it. And it, it happened in 2022. And it's likely going to happen again if gas prices do go up. But you know, I don't care personally. 
I know I don't really travel too much anyways, but people that are going to complain about the gas prices likely will see that go up because of the attacks on the refineries. But oh well, in my opinion, right? Oh well, right? Ukraine's got to do what they got to do and to limit um, Russia's invasion and their power for the invasion, they got to hit those specific targets. They got to hit those oil refineries. That's how Russia continues the invasion, right? So U.S. being, yo, stop because the markets will take an effect. Like, nobody cares, I guess. Like, nobody wants to hear that right now. I don't, I don't. But it's going to be a big deal um, when the election comes up, when we get closer to the November election, you guys. It's just going to get there. So Russian losses as of April 9th. 580 troops, 45 APV, 71 vehicles and fuel tanks, 23 tanks, 30 artillery systems, 37 UAVs. We got two anti-aircraft warfare and one special equipment. That is Russian losses as of April 9th, 2024. Had a question from Rodent. Do you think the U.S. is saying that publicly, but behind the scenes is saying something different? Like, go ahead and hit them. Maybe. Could be. Right? I mean, information war. Um, obviously, you got a operational security and russia's watching everything the west does and vice versa so it could be could be just public statements and then behind the scenes it's like hey we don't really care we're just saying this because russia will or whatever you know what i mean so it could be true but obviously we're not within we're not in those conversations and we're not in those closed door rooms so you can you can guess but i mean it started from the financial times article here i got the bookmark for you guys today it started with that financial times article that was sus, okay, and then people quickly um, figured out that it wasn't, and it was an actual source, and then it continues. So here's the latest statements on the aid, but I do have good news for aid. We're, it's, it's a bunch of things going on. The Republicans are back in Congress. Congress is back. Nothing really today at all. Uh, we can go over what Speaker Johnson said a little later. We'll get into like the nitty-gritty of American stuff at the end. We'll go through all the latest with Ukraine. We'll talk to Greg Terry. He's with his uh, mother right now, or he's got a personal. He's got a personal thing going on, um, fixing a tractor. It looks like, looks like he's got to fix a lawnmower. Then he'll be tuned in with with us and give us an update. But we're gonna be going through all the latest news and events until then. Also, you guys, really quick, really really quick notes before I dive in. I, I continue to forget things, but uh, Monday, next week, I'll be starting to stream from my new place, if not by Tuesday at the latest. I'm gonna, it'll all next week, just be flexible. Might be shorter streams. It might, I don't know, I, I have to game because it helps my me continue, but I might have to limit some things, especially next week because I'm moving and I'm moving into this new apartment. It's coming up. And a lot of people have been saying, yo, I thought you already moved. I haven't moved yet. I, I had to get the approval. Like you have to apply to it and get approved and show renter history. Like I've had here for the last two years, never missed a rent payment, never missed any payments. And it's a nicer place. So Approval went through. We're good to go, and I'm moving next week. I'm moving my stuff over. It'll be, it'll be a slow process. Eh, I'm gonna try to hurry it up though. I don't really have a whole lot of stuff, but I'm gonna get my stream stuff and my stream all set up in my new place, and then that way I'm there and I can just move my stuff from here slowly over the next week. So that's pretty exciting. More videos are coming. All right, I wanted to put a video out today on this topic that you're looking at right now. I want to put a video out about the aid and I'm just having video ideas. I'm watching and I just can't wait to get back to doing that, but I don't want to, I, I got lots to do to get ready to leave. So when I get to my new place, expect a, well, we've already expanded the stream length, but I'm going to temporarily reduce that just while I'm getting ready to leave and move. But videos are coming back, more conversations with folks that are connected to Ukraine, both inside and out. We're going to have a lot coming up for you guys as soon as I get this move over with. I'm already like feeling the motivation. Like I'm ready to get out of ready to get out of this place. It's been a good, good spot for my first starter apartment for the last two years. Um, but with the constant connection problems and just, uh, just in general, I want, I'm ready to move on. So I'm pretty excited about that. So for you guys, we will have more content and videos focused on some of the topics I talk about during the stream. And that will just help my channel. Like my channel is right now because all I do is streams. All I do is live streams and Americans and People that I want these messages to get to don't have time to sit through and watch four hours of stream. Now, there's streamers that have a big audience that do this, but I don't, I mean, I have a few of y'all that do that. But a lot of you guys are here for just one topic, and that's Ukraine. I can do a lot of that in videos, and I've been talking about that in the past. And what I'm saying is, is we will really be diving into that starting next week when I get into my new place. Maybe, eh, maybe two weeks. 
because next week I'll be moving. So it might take me a little bit to get videos done. Unless I just do some hip fire videos and I just do a cell phone quick video, talk to you guys and post it. We'll see. All right. So today we had Natasha Bertrand, right? Natasha Bertrand posted this on Twitter. She's a CNN correspondent covering the Pentagon and national security. And there she is. Asked the Biden administration is discouraging Ukraine from striking Russian energy infrastructure. Secretary Austin acknowledges that the admin has concerns about how it will affect global energy markets. Certainly, those attacks could have a knock-on effect in terms of the global energy situation. Austin says, but quite frankly, I think Ukraine is better served in going after tactical and operational targets that can directly influence the current fight. Right. Okay. What, Austin? Listen. Check it out. Okay, Ukraine could do that if they were getting the help from the United States. Okay, it's like we're, we're it's like you're playing we're tap dancing. We're just tap dancing here. Um, and I Lloyd Austin's done a good job. I think I've never really had anything bad to say about Lloyd Austin. I still don't as a person. I don't think he's a bad person. But like, yo, that they would be. It would be awesome for Ukraine to hit tactical and operational targets like inside Ukraine. Oh, but they can't. Because they're not being supplied with ammunition, artillery, and long-range missiles. How are they going to do that? So they're trying to uh, tackle the problem at the source. Be like, okay, well, we don't have artillery, long-range missiles, and ammunition to uh, destroy them on our territory. Right? To keep that, because all they're going to, all Russia's going to do is just keep funneling shit into the into the occupied territories. Just keep funneling things from Moscow and from other places, just right into the occupied territories. It's like you know what I mean. It's like Ukraine will take out whatever. Oh, no, that'll be replaced. Russia will just put it right back into the occupied territory. So Ukraine, being as smart as they are, like, okay, well, since we're not even getting the bare minimum to, like, stop that from happening, let's just start hitting Russian refineries. Let's just start hitting these bases directly to stop it from flowing in, at least. Like, the, they're thinking macro, right? And the United States is like, well, Ukraine, if you could just handle what's happening on your situation, because the other thing is, it is an election year, like I mentioned to you guys. If gas prices go up, this is the this is the tightrope. That's why I need you guys to play games like Civilization and shit, so you understand the political tightrope that this is. And I'm not making, and I already made my statement that I I'm I'm a strong-minded person. Majority of Americans are not smart, strong-minded. It's just the simple matter of the fact. So I understand the situation. I understand that gas prices will likely go up if Ukraine continues to hit these refineries. I've accepted this because Ukraine's fighting for their existence. Unfortunately, the majority of Americans are not going to accept this. I'm telling you guys that now. So they're trying to get ahead of the political fallout of this. If you haven't noticed, it's a lot of American bullshit that like limits the success for Ukraine here. And I don't have an answer for that. I don't have a excuse for it. Definitely don't. It's just the way it is. It's just the way that our current political landscape is in the United States, where you got to like not do things and then do things to make sure that the other political party doesn't try to destroy what you have going on or I don't know. It's just like a, it's like a, um, a tug of war. So they're trying to do this to try to prevent Americans from outcrying about gas prices going up, which will get Donald Trump more points in the polls, right? It, it's an election year. I'm, I'm, I'm just being real about it. Let's go, Nancy. I got my buy me a hot dog um, notification on now. That's the other thing I added. Thank you so much, Nancy. You can buy me a hot dog. Link is in the description. A certain YouTube channel likes calling me the hot dog boy. Boy, they're about to start seeing hot dog boy make hot dogs on here. So thank you so much, Nancy. But anyways, um, I, and again, I'm just explaining the situation. It's not an excuse. It's because it's an election year. And gas prices, anything that goes up that Americans just do... Like, again, just simple gas prices. If they go up 30, 20, 30 cents, oh my, it's an outrage. It's an outrage. What is the Biden administration doing? Why are these gas prices going up? Yeah, we can't even survive out here. We can't even feed ourselves. I personally think it's a skill issue. Um, the economy's going up. Everything's changing. So, I don't know. I think it's a big skill issue in the United States in general. But understanding that um, Ukraine's got to do what they got to do. Ukraine's got to stop Russia from invading their country. And and if the United States was actually helping Ukraine, how we're supposed to be, um, Ukraine could hit these tactical and operational targets that can direct. And actually, I would argue and throw this back at Lloyd Austin if I was in this press room and say that's exactly what Ukraine is doing. Is that not what Ukraine is doing? That they're ta hitting tactical and operational targets that directly influence the fight. 
are they not hitting these oil refineries that are obviously directly it's it's if the united states is telling ukraine to stop that means you got a, a russian lobby that's like yo that means it's hurting russia actually that's what that's what it's telling me right because you got you just a simple fact right we know that we have russian lobbyists and russian money that's in american government that's in american governmental figures okay because they're a big nuclear superpower you got this big stupid giant stupid country that takes up majority of the world so they have influence over american government not that i'm happy about that but it's the unfortunate fact here that we've had to come to realize since russia's invaded so they're doing everything they can um, and they're going to do everything they can to try to make it a political move to the point where they're now starting to co-opt actual political talking points within the united states when you look at russia let me see here russia blaming um let me see I forgot to save this, or did I? Let me double. Let me see if I saved it. I've got different bookmark sections now. No, I didn't save it yet. Um, Russia blame the crocus on on Hunter Biden again. Well, not again, but they started blaming the uh, attacks that Burisma knew. There you go. Okay, so Russia put out today. MAGA comes up with this most ridiculous disinformation narrative yet. They're blaming Hunter Biden and Burisma for the Moscow terrorist attack. So this is the new one. And that's, the, that's, what, that's why when Tucker Carlson went to go interview Putin, the propagandists were pissed. They're like, yo, come on, Grandpa Putin. You didn't even, you didn't even get your own people. All those Americans that are lo looking for a hero in propaganda, and you, like, didn't, you were given history, history lessons that MAGA and these people aren't going to even listen to, Grandpa Putin. And Tucker was hoping for it too. He was really hoping that Putin was going to be giving red pill type or even tanky. I don't know, but he really appeals more so to the red pill. He just, I don't know. The tankies just play to this old timey communist worker thing and they don't even actually pay attention to like Russia's current actions. Whereas like the far right, like see Russia for what they are. And they're like, hell yeah, that's a, that's the, that's the trad uh, utopia. Right? They're anti-woke, anti-woke country. It's crazy. But And then I wish the far left would even look at this. When I say far left, I mean like tankies and communists, people that are on the far, 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 far left. If you're like far left, you're not far left enough for me you know, what I'm talking about when I'm saying that. I'm talking about the watermelon ISIS that's out here on Twitter. I look to Russia as some old-timey workers' paradise from the Soviet Union. Okay, And it's crazy because Russia doesn't even play that. They play that like the one parade a year. Like when they have their when they have their victory day parade or whatever, and that's it. Everything else is just fascism and totalitarianism and appeasing to MAGA, which is apparently the far, 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 far left's enemy. Apparently not. Is this in is this in English? No. Do we have um English translations. For you now, the Russian investigative committee has revealed the alleged sponsors of the Crocus terror attack in Moscow. It reports Burisma Holdings, an oil and gas company that operates in Ukraine, provided the funds to the terrorists that committed that atrocity. Okay, so remember, when we're watching things like this, you know that it's all BS. It's just to understand why it's BS. Okay, we're not watching this as if we're receiving information here. You are but you're receiving the, how the narrative is being drafted, right? They're connecting the MAGA narratives about Hunter Biden and Burisma to some new shit about the terrorist attack because they've been slowly trying to blame it on Ukraine somehow. What better than to blame Ukraine and also bring Hunter Biden and all that shit that failed, which is kind of ironic because the GOP and the Republican witness, their star witness in the Hunter Biden laptop bullshit and everything that fell through was a literal Russian agent. It's crazy. And it's crazy, and and there and people uh, in terms of um, propagandists are picking this up today. So again, when we watch this, it's not like oh man, there could be some truth to this. There's none. There's no truth with this. But you have to. You don't have to. I, you're gonna if you're watching my stream, you're gonna watch it. But you're watching it to put the puzzle pieces together of how these narratives are crafted. If that makes sense, like you watch it with a different type of a lens. That's why we watch the Russian media monitor. That's why we have, I play Fox News. That's why I play Donald Trump. I play everybody and I hear crying in the chat. Uh, I don't like to hear the voice. The voice. Okay, we're putting puzzle, we're putting a puzzle together. There's misinformation going on. It's an information war, and you gotta hear people that you don't like or sources that are clearly bad. Now, this is a bad source. I do not endorse RT whatsoever. 
but they're a part of the puzzle piece of misinformation here. So that's why I got to give you guys this. Let's continue. In Ukraine, provided the funds to the terrorists that committed that atrocity. Hunter Biden, of course, the US president's son, formerly ran that company. The findings claim the money was used to sponsor terrorist attacks outside the Russian Federation to eliminate prominent political and public figures. Right. Well, the committee has opened a criminal case on Burisma's financing against officials of the US and NATO countries. So do stay with us for any updates on that breaking news story in the coming hours. Right. Okay. Absolutely not. Okay, here's it looks like here's the translated version. Yeah, all the top all the top propagandists are sharing this. Investigative Suleiman Ahmed, investigative journalist. Look at Mario Nafal. Hunter Biden linked Burisma oil funded terrorist attacks in Russia. All right, let's just read the read the денежные средства, поступавшие Sorry. We go back to the beginning. According to the results of the audit organized in connection with appeal group of deputies of state Duma and other persons, the investigative committee of Russia opened a criminal case on the financing of terrorism. It has been established that funds received through commercial organizations, in particular the oil and gas company Burisma Holdings, operating on the territory of Ukraine, have been used in recent years to carry out terror attacks against the Russian Federation as well as abroad. In order to eliminate prominent political and public figures and cause economic damage. The investigation in cooperation with other special services and financial intelligence checks the sources of income and other movement of funds in the amount of several million U.S. dollars. Right. The involvement of specific individuals from among the employees of the government agencies and public commercial organizations in Western countries. In addition, the connections of the direct perpetrators of terrorist acts with foreign curators, organizers, and sponsors are being worked in an investigative and operational way and so many words and so many statements and, and things that are just... So many investigations are happening. A lot of words, a lot of just, just accusations, really, there. There is no evidence within that. Even with that, it's just crying and, and just accusations. Based on the results of the inspe whose inspection? Russia's? <laughs> like... Uh, and boom, there you go, Ozzy Kozak. Sydney, Australia, they got some Votniks there. Yeah, they got some Votniks in Sydney for some reason, my Australian audience. Boom, Hunter Biden linked oil and gas company Burisma Holdings operating in Ukraine, funded the terrorist attacks in Russian government. Oof. 220,000 views. Breaking Moscow claims Hunter Biden linked Ukraine. And again, these are all people that play this game. They all play the propaganda game, so they're gonna just regurgitate this. You got Ed, you try, or I said Brian, sorry. Brian and Ed look very similar, because they're, they're twins. Brian fought back today. Unbelievable Russian claims Rizma, the Hunter Biden, once worked for in the West and are responsible for terrorist attacks in Russia. State media company RT tried to link Hunter Biden to the terror attacks investigation, claiming that they have established that the funds flowing through commercial organizations, including oil gas, government, Burisma, operating in Ukraine, have been used in recent years to carry out terrorist attacks in Russia. Watching some Republicans on X turn against their own country to believe what Russia says is stating would be amusing if it wasn't so serious, literally. There you go, though. Don't take it from me. I saved a bookmark after all this went down. You can hear it from an American politician yourself. It's And I put a poll out on my on my YouTube channel about this. Where the hell did it go now? Oh, is it, about, is it in Ukraine? It is. Okay. So... Fresh from his nine-month battle trying to shut down the U.S. military for Putin, this is Tommy Tuberville, tells Pentagon head Lloyd Austin that the Russians should be deciding who gets to join NATO. What do you guys think? Secretary Blinken say last week in Brussels that uh, Ukraine will soon be in NATO. You agree with that? that that's, that's, uh, that's the goal of uh, the NATO members is to, at, at some point, uh, uh, bring Ukraine into into NATO, and that's certainly something that Ukraine wants to see. If you're Russia, would you want that? I'm just asking. I mean, we're 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 playing 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 games with Russia right now. I just want to understand why we would do that. Uh, certainly, if I was Russia, I would not want that, uh, Senator. I would also not want Finland and Sweden to be a part of uh, NATO. I heard Tommy Tuberville from Alabama. Isn't that? What, have you thought about what Russia thinks of this? Have you thought, and that's been their whole argument. That's been the whole GOP argument from the politician level. Have you thought about Russia here? 
and they played this whole game. They've been doing it in for two years, you guys. Like, I'm glad that we've had Republicans and conservative voters that can see the facts of the matter. You've had onesie and twosie GOP politicians that have been on board. The rest of them have been all about NATO, the bold Russian propaganda talking points about NATO expansion and wah, Russia victimhood and wah, Russia, all this the whole time, and they continue it. Wait a minute, wait, have you thought about Russia's feelings in this situation? It's just ridiculous, you guys. It's just, it's just ridiculous. We'll get into that a little deeper as time goes on here. I want to give you guys some good news, right? I don't have any news on the large aid bill. That still hasn't been through. We don't know what the hell. Mike Johnson is, you guys want to know what's going on with Mike Johnson today? Like, he has one specific job to do, and that's to get aid through and to get bills through, and he's on fucking Twitter, bro. Look at Mike Johnson's over here. Mike Johnson is literally on Twitter four hours ago, um, editing White House tweets and then reposting them as his own. If you're wondering what the Republican Speaker of the House is doing today, because Congress is back. They're back in session today. I told you guys, like, hey, maybe we'll see some movement on the bill when they get back. Is what he's doing. Is what he's spending his there he is. Is what he's spending his time doing. So do you, just not even debunking White House statements, just crossing words out and replacing them with words. Is this Republican debunking? Where you just make words appear that aren't what the White House wrote, which is really weird. That's just really weird. Now uh, this week, Speaker Johnson and my fellow impeachment managers, okay, they're focused on impeaching Secretary Mayorkas for the U.S. southern border because according to Republicans, there's an invasion there. So you got to realize, you guys, it's deeper than this. I'm so, again, I will reiterate, I am so glad that there are many Republican voters and conservative voters like you, regular people. Maybe you're a politician in my chat. I'd be better get doing your job, but most of you guys are just regular old individuals out here. Well, the Republican Party has been selling that we have an invasion down here for like a year and a half now. Maybe, maybe a little more. I don't think it started in 2022. No. No, I'm sorry, it would have been a year, sorry, a year, not a year and a half. It was started, I think it started in 2023 of selling that there's an invasion here and that is where the attention is really needed and not Ukraine, not Ukraine's border. And that's been the whole message of this whole time. So they're playing that. You got to understand the whole mindset and it breaks down the American political system and culture war stuff back and forth and talking points, but that's all relevant. Some people just don't like to talk about it when it comes to Ukraine because it's going to push away Republican viewers or Republican voters because they just don't want to hear it. I'm tired of you criticizing Republicans all the time. I'm tired of it. <laughs> I mean, dude, it'd be different if it was Speaker Pelosi and she was doing this. And I and it was Nancy Pelosi on here and she's doing this bullshit while we're all unanimously waiting for any type of aid from the Congress to pass here which is ridiculous because it passed bipartisan in the Senate and not, not all Republicans voted for it, but 70% of the Senate did. So what? Okay. And it should have been more. It should have been more, but it's still 70% in the Senate. And also I'm starting to see on Facebook and other places that are disconnected from Ukraine, they're still, they still want to see gridlock in the government. Like when you think of bills passing in the government, do you guys want to see gridlock? Like, I don't understand the mindset. Um, bipartisan stuff doesn't mean that you don't get anything done. Bipartisan stuff means you work together to get bills passed together, and it gets through. Not one bill from one side, and then the other side has to fight back at it, and then re override it with their own bill, and it just and then it's all gridlock because I don't know. But I'm seeing this. I'm seeing rhetoric come up like, oh, as long as nothing gets done in the government, that that's a good thing. That means that they're. How is that good, bro? <laughs> How is that good? I, it never has been explained to me, even when I was an open Republican conservative voter. And I'd be explained to me that it's a good thing when the Democrats and the Republicans can't get anything done. Um, I don't understand that. And it's more so because every time re bills get through, Republicans call it a, they're, they're packing it full. It's a full of pork in the bill. Just tons of phrases and words that are said about bills that go through because Republicans don't want to pass anything for America. That's why the border bill that was put up, and it's going to be interesting to see how this impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas goes, but Republicans could have had a big border bill. Could have. Could have had the biggest Republican border bill that you've ever seen with a Democrat president and a Democrat-led Senate. And you would have had, boy, 
but you've nitpicked the some of the details that weren't even fucking relevant about uh oh well it allows this amount of people to per day before they even make a decision and i can't even do this bill is sucks hey, there's the have you even read the bill is so many and it's every time have you even read the bill have you even seen what's in it oh my god they thought they stuffed that they stuff every bill because it's the only way to get things through because otherwise they're in gridlock the entire time so they add shit to the bills because nothing ever gets done and when people cheer on the fact that nothing gets done that's just stupid we need bills to pass and they need to they do need to be bipartisan i'm hoping that in the future we can get rid of the term bipartisan because there'll be more than two parties this two-party system is driving america off a cliff regardless no matter what so hopefully the term multi part i don't multi-partisan or i don't know shit think of a new term when it, when we can get some new parties that have or more parties you can keep the democrats and the republicans but we definitely in my opinion need some more with relevancy and power in there so we're not gridlocked or stuck between two parties like say republicans want to get something done and democrats stop it or right now when the entire world is waiting on the united states to get ukraine aid and you have the republican party stopping it or again if it was vice versa i would be have the same criticisms if it was the democrat party that was stopping aid to ukraine all right so that's my rant we'll get into some more details about that in a bit but let's give you guys some some good news for aid, which again, isn't going to be the solving factor of this, but it still shows you that the Biden administration itself, at least, is continuing to try to make efforts to give Ukraine something while this aid bill is on the floor of the House and Republicans are doing nothing. And Speaker Johnson is making, I don't even know how to explain this, making elementary level edits to White House tweets. I don't understand that. It just doesn't make any sense. But Biden administration, contrary to criticism on Twitter, because I'm seeing that. Now I'm seeing it on Twitter too, that and then you got Republican operatives on Twitter that are trying to make anything. Well, there's I have no idea how they've twisted the fact that this is Biden's issue. That the reason why the aid hasn't gotten through or why Ukraine's struggling to get aid is Biden administration problem. They most certainly haven't been sending Ukraine everything they could be, but I've had that criticism every the whole time. The whole time I've been very hawkish with aid to Ukraine. I've been like, yo, like in real time as stuff was happening for the last two years, I was criticizing Biden, the Biden administration for being slow on aid deliveries or like limiting or Jake Sullivan getting on the podium and saying, oh, we can't do that because it might escalate the Russians or whatever. Just stupid decisions along the way. The difference is I can go to Congress and talk to Democrats and I'm not a Democrat. And I can talk to them about how important it is to send aid to Ukraine. And they're taking notes and they're writing stuff down and the actions follow the words. Now we got to work on getting the excess defense articles through. That's a good talking point that I've heard, but that's been a point since January. That's been a point since December. And to do this now and to play this game, which I call it tap dancing, while there's literally an aid bill on the house floor for 60 billion for Ukraine, and you're going to tap dance and play this, well, what could have been and what, what should have happened and what, 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 what about, what about, what about, what about? Yeah. Okay. I know for sure. The good news is Biden and again, the Democrats are at least open to hearing more criticisms and open to meeting with relevant um, organizations, voices, talking to Ukrainians, whatever. Republicans at least when I went to Congress and I'm trying to get back there again to see if it's changed so I can tell you guys from my own experience if the Republicans are even willing to listen to us. Because in September of last year, that was last year in September, they absolutely were not. They were focused on getting a new speaker in. There because Speaker McCarthy lost his job and while we were there, about rounds of voting on the next speaker because Mike Johnson wasn't in power yet. They were you just got put in place, I think, a day or two after we left Washington, D.C. with Rosome, talking to these people about why it's important to aid Ukraine. That's the difference. They're not even, Republicans aren't even willing to talk to, or they put us in the hallway. Donald Trump's policy for Ukraine, not just dog shit, none, no policy. So I get it. You want to play the tap dancing, and the, it's great to have open dialogue about what Biden administration should have been doing. And I've been, very, I personally, very open about the fact that Ukraine hasn't been getting everything that they should have been. Okay, you can't go back in time and undo that. 
unfortunately. I wish I could. I wish I could do have a time machine. Go back to I'd go back to 2021, 2020, 2019, and that stupid phone call with Donald Trump to Zelensky. If I had the foresight, if I had the foresight of knowing everything that was going to happen and all this shit, and go back and undo it all and say, hey, better give Ukraine the Abrams right away. Give Ukraine the attackums right away. Give them the give them the Patriot no delay. If I could do that, but I can't. But I can't. And the difference is you got one side that's willing to at least listen and implement changes and still do everything they can to get Ukraine something. And you got a brick wall with the other side. Or if or anything, go away. Brick wall, go away. Or eh, you're not giving everything you could. We gotta give more, gotta give more with the other side. That's how I view it right now. And if things change, I'll have a different analysis, but I don't right now because well, Tuesday's almost over. It's six, it's seven PM. Congress is Maybe there's a couple staffers there. Maybe a house elected officials doing email stuff right now, but they're not, they're not doing anything for Ukraine at all. No. Here's DW U S Congress reconvenes as Ukraine aid remains stalled. U.S. Congress reconvened this week with all eyes on a potential vote for approving a long-delayed $60 billion military aid package for Ukraine. Thank you so much for the gifteds from Kay. Thank you for becoming a member. Thank you, Linda, for the gifteds. Thank you, iBlue, for the gifteds. It does help significantly. So the foreign aid package, which altogether totals $95 billion in aid for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, was passed by the Democrat-controlled Senate in February, but it stalled in the lower house of Congress where Republicans hold a thin majority. Republicans have held up spending bills in Congress demanding that stronger controls first be put in place to curb the arrival of migrants at the U.S. southern border. Johnson is seeking to find a compromise to have Ukraine aid approved. On Tuesday, Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene renewed threats to have Johnson removed as Speaker of the House if Ukraine aid vote is tabled. Let's go to that really quick. Ma Moscow Marjorie. That's the new nickname for Marjorie Taylor Greene. Republican Georgia Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene authored a resolution to force the House to take a vote of no confidence in Speaker Mike Johnson. That's great. That's and so crazy. I do crazy. not wish to inflict pain on our conference and to throw, to throw the House in chaos. But this is basically a warning. Green railed at Johnson for negotiating spending bills with Democrats and not giving members enough time to read legislation before voting. Other conservatives criticize Republicans for caving on their principles. Why the hell are you in Congress? That's why we're Article 1. But we're too chicken to use the power. The House passes most big bills with more Democrats than Republicans, begging the question, who's calling the shots? Not His Republicans. may not be Speaker of the House, um, but definitely uh, leader of the Democratic caucus and probably leader of the Congress is Hakeem Jeffries. The red line for Green is if Johnson calls up a bill to aid Ukraine. Johnson implores Republicans to cease the infighting. I think all of our colleagues recognize that um, we can't have a distraction right now. It's Polit like they do it to themselves, bro. I'm so tired of it, dude. I'm literally so tired of it. It's a game. It's, ta it's tap dancing. They, they, like, what are you, the infighting is from your own people, bro. Like, not even, I'm, I'm, I'm not even counting Reagan Republicans, like, or people that are, like, call themselves Reagan Republicans because they're anti-Trump. Like, he is MAGA. Mike Johnson is MAGA. It is his own caucus his own type of politicians that are doing it, talking about the infighting right now. Boy, stop. Stop the games. Stop the madness. Stop the clownery. It's all them, dude. And then they want to play victim. I think all of our colleagues recognize that um, we can't have a distraction right now. Political observer. You were the distraction. There's doubt Republicans want a rerun of last year's Donnybrook when oh, the House geez. lacked the speaker for three weeks. It was utter chaos. I think Johnson uh, benefits uh, from the the terrible example that was set, uh, you know, several months ago uh, when when McCarthy was ousted. There's concern that more turmoil could prompt additional Republican resignations that could flip control of the House to Democrats. That's a risk, but I don't think that's going to happen. Hakeem is not going to be the speaker. Democrats didn't help save Kevin McCarthy last time, but the calculus could be different if there's a threat to Johnson especially if Democrats can leverage the speaker on aid to Ukraine. That's what they're okay. going to do. I think I told you guys that a couple months ago. Did I tell you guys that? And I was telling you that Republicans, um, specifically MAGA Republicans, are going to be coming for Mike Johnson now? 
because he's passing aid. And I guess, I don't know, I guess I do have more Republican viewers than I thought. And people are like, no, they're not. No, they're not. Or even when I was, boy, when, I, when the aid stopped. And I said, it's going to be some trouble with the aid from the mega wing. No, they're not. They're going to continue to send aid to Ukraine no matter what. Ukraine's our ally. We view them as our ally. It's, they've been anti-Ukraine the whole time. They being MAGA. They have not supported Ukraine at all. Even when the aid was getting through in 2022, they had pushback. It's like Kevin McCarthy lost his job. And now Speaker Johnson right, looks like he's up going to lose his job within MAGA for doing this. This morning as the House returns to work. But yeah, we got to talk about with, with Twitter users, David and fucking what I would lead. What's the other one? Who's the other guy? Mott? Randy? Yeah. Fucking Randy talking about all this tap, just, again, tap dancing about what could have been with the Biden administration. Well, like in our face, this is like in our face right now. And Mike Johnson's making corrections on the White House uh, Twitter page. They, a new effort by Republican Marjorie Taylor Greene to oust House Speaker Mike Johnson. She just sent a letter to a Republican colleague saying in part, quote, he is throwing our own razor thin majority into chaos by not serving his own GOP conference that elected him. And I really wish, I truly wish that Marjorie Taylor Greene's words were irrelevant. I really wish that that was the, the case. And I mean, yeah, I mean, when it comes to the sides versus each other, it is, I guess. But she is the, the top one with the MAGA base. Okay, the MAGA base looks to her as like their queen. And she's like what they re what she represents them. So unfortunately, her words have weight when it comes to pushback against aid to Ukraine, with specifically with that. It's Lauren Fox. Again, not only with Democrats, but with the Republicans trying to get aid through, clearly she's gonna try to take Mike Johnson down. With us now on Capitol Hill, how serious is Marjorie Taylor Greene about this? Well, she's certainly not going away, and she's ramping up all of her complaints against Speaker Mike Johnson. This comes as we are waiting to see whether or not she really moves forward with this effort to try and oust him from the speakership. But this new five-page letter acquired for, by our colleague Annie Grayer lays out to her colleagues explicitly why she thinks Mike Johnson isn't up to the job. And she talks about the passage of those series of spending bills through the fall into the winter and now just a few weeks ago she also lays out concerns about the direction that the speaker is moving when it comes to additional aid for Ukraine she also calls him out for what he is doing to try and advance legislation to renew section 702 of the federal intelligence surveillance act something that has divided Republicans within the conference but Marjorie Taylor Greene not just writing this letter she also held a town hall in her district last night in Georgia. Here's what she was saying about Speaker Johnson there. Thank you, Linda. How dare our own speaker that we elected pass that spending bill and not do anything for that border? Okay. Um, that's just that's just the mindset right there. Uh, we put we put him in that spot. Boy, he's the speaker of the house for the representatives for all of them. Just because he's the Republican, because the Republicans have the majority, that's just the default. But he's, she's making it seem like Republican voters elected Mike Johnson into the Speaker of the House position. And so that's how she's trying to get Republican voters to get mad at it and get onto her side, because we put him in that spot. Nothing. That's ridiculous. It's, it's horrid. It's horrid. I will not tolerate a Speaker of the House that I voted for to sell us out. I will not tolerate it. You got like two claps in there. It's crazy. I, I, I'm even, I, maybe we got to tap into MAGA and see like, are they okay? Or maybe, you know, maybe I need to find an open MAGA person and be like, how are you doing? Hey, how are, how's your mental health right now? You know, like, are you okay? I'm not gonna, I'm obviously not gonna do anything for a moment. You all right? You okay with all this? Cause boy, what a chaotic situation here. Cause you have your own MAGA politicians that are speaking against MAGA. It's like infighting of MAGA. It's like this. It's like an onion. You got MAGA infighting, but then you got Republicans fighting them. And then obviously you got the Democrats and like people in the middle, like fighting all of that. And it's like, and then you got even the Democrat, you got the far, far tankies that are mad, but they're not really irrelevant. But in the Republican a bubble, you got onions going on. You got MAGA fighting each other, but then the, the grander, the outer layer of like the Republicans as a whole fighting all of it. Are fighting into it, but they're not fighting hard enough, in my opinion.
the non MAGA Republicans need to fight uh, against all of it. Like whatever MAGA side that is fa uh, factioning the Marjorie MAGA Moscow MAGA side or the Mike Johnson MAGA light side. I don't fucking know, bro. Yeah, MAGA light with Mike Johnson, Moscow light, and you got Moscow heavy with Marjorie Taylor Greene. Pick your pick your pick your side. Yeah. Lighter lighter heavy. Or IPA. There you go. Moscow IPA with the MAGA side. She is not explicitly saying what would trigger an effort by her to try and oust Speaker Johnson, but it's clearly weighing on the Speaker as the House of Representatives returns today. We still have not seen details of what he plans to do when it comes to additional aid for Ukraine. He's floated a series of ideas. I'm told that he's still having conversations with his colleagues, in part because this threat is looming large. John? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, there is a difference between a sternly worded letter and action on the House floor. We will see if it crosses from one area into the other. Lauren Fox, thank you very much. Kate? Joining us now is CNN political commentator and Democratic strategist Maria Card. And now we don't need to hear a Democratic strategist. Okay. Train aid. Um, this was 59 minutes ago. This is just the latest updates. We're gonna have Greg. So Congress is Gre Greg is ready to go, you guys. But let's just get the we'll just get this rundown of Congress and aid to Ukraine out of the way. And then when Greg joins us, we'll do a full map update and talk about the front lines. Returning this week from a two week break with a whole lot to tackle in the House. Speaker Mike Johnson uh, needs to navigate through a series of divisive issues, including Ukraine aid and funding for the Baltimore Bridge, while working with a slimming majority and the threat of a motion to vacate. And then in the Senate law, look, look at all this stuff that they have to do. Obviously, Ukraine at the top, but like the Baltimore Bridge is very that, that's like up there. OK, that's like right behind it for internal U.S. needs. And oh, my, it's just so much stuff that they have to get done. Mike Johnson, where's he at? This is what Mike Johnson's doing today. So much stuff that they have to do. Making edits four out five hours ago now. It's just sad. This week will be presented articles of impeachment against DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. NBC's Ali Vitali is joining us now from uh, Capitol Hill. Wow, do they have a lot on their plate um, as they return from? Um, and they're no, two they're doing off. nothing. Ali, walk us through it. A lot on their plate, Yasmin. Senate comes back this afternoon. House comes back tomorrow. I admit, I think a lot of us are probably going to take a pause, try to go outside in a little bit, and see what we can see with the eclipse. I have. Okay, so it sounds like the House is. Oh, this is tomorrow. Oh, that was today then. This is a day ago. So they should have been back there back today. Themed heart, th themed moon and sun earrings on. Oh, we already heard this lady. We heard a clip from her from yesterday. I don't know why they, it says 59 minutes ago. Why would they update that? We heard that lady yesterday. We don't need to listen to it again. Anthony Blinken. That was two days ago. We're good there. Face the nation. Congress returns from recess. Ukraine aid among priorities. Hold on. Is there anything new? They literally did nothing today, huh? David Cameron met with Republicans. Britain's top diplomat David Cameron insisted it's profoundly in your interest for the U.S. to pass a stalled package of aid to Ukraine hours after a face-to-face -face meeting with Donald Trump. He met with Donald Trump, too. Oh, their press conference. You got to watch that. I can't believe we well, we gotta we gotta listen to that, y'all. Listen, all right, Greg, we got you. Right after this, we gotta listen to this. This is the biggest thing today, I believe. I'm gonna put it on speed though. So they actually start. Both of our meetings that we had. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. It is uh, as always a great pleasure to have Foreign Secretary Cameron here at the State Department in Washington. We were just together, literally sitting next to each other, for the uh, NATO meetings that we had in Brussels last week. But uh, we've had an ongoing conversation, an ongoing consultation about the major challenges that both of our countries are facing and facing together. Uh, and today was another important chapter in, uh, in those conversations. Uh, starting with Ukraine, uh, we, of course, reaffirmed the imperative of continuing to support and help Ukraine defend itself against the ongoing Russian aggression. I have to say that the United Kingdom has been an extraordinary leader in this effort from day one, imposing sanctions and export controls on Russia 
uh, and uh, hindering its ability to continue to finance the war. Is it loud enough, you guys? Ramping up investments in the defense industrial base. This is uh, a major effort that our two countries are engaged in with many other countries, both for immediate needs but also for the future. We have major British defense companies that are opening offices in Kyiv, working jointly with our Ukrainian friends, helping Ukraine develop uh, its own uh, defense products. And uh, the UK was the first country to formalize and finalize the bilateral security agreements that 30 countries have either now concluded negotiations on or are in the process of negotiating with Ukraine to help Ukraine develop a future force, one that can deter aggression uh, and defend itself in, in the future. Uh, we talked about ways to strengthen efforts to prevent the transfer and weapons of material to Russia for use in Ukraine. Uh, and this is an ongoing challenge, uh, and we see um, weapons, uh, we also see technologies to support the defense industrial base in uh, Russia coming from North Korea, from Iran, from China. This is an area of particular concern for not only the United States and the United Kingdom, but many of our allies and partners throughout uh, Europe. Uh, we also uh, talked about the imperative of getting assistance to Ukraine now in terms of additional munitions, air defenses, artillery. We both heard last week from the Ukrainian Foreign Minister Kaleb at NATO about the uh, immediate needs. Both of our countries are uh, pressing ourselves and pressing others uh, to do this. And in that light, the supplemental budget request that President Biden has made of Congress is urgent uh, and it's imperative. Um, the House is now back in session. Uh, we look to see that brought before the House and, and to get a vote as quickly as possible. And again, I've said this before, but it is always worth reminding that when it comes to burden sharing, I have never seen a better example in, in my time in government now over 30 years. The United States has done extraordinary things for Ukraine. Our European partners and others beyond Europe, around the world, have done even more over the last two years. Uh, military support, economic support, humanitarian support. So uh, there's genuine burden sharing and carrying the load. We need to continue to do our part. And again, I'll remind that the overwhelming majority of the um, resources in the supplemental budget request will actually be invested right here in the United States in our own defense industrial base to produce what Ukraine needs, but providing in the meantime good American jobs. We, of course, discussed the situation in the Middle East uh, and in Gaza. Um, Israel has made important commitments to significantly increase the supply of humanitarian assistance throughout Gaza and has taken some initial actions as well uh, to move on those commitments. Uh, we're looking at a number of critical things that need to happen in the coming days, including opening a new northern point of entry for assistance into Gaza, uh, using Ashdod uh, on a regular basis, maximizing the flow of assistance from Jordan, um, as well as putting in place uh, a much more effective deconfliction mechanism with the humanitarian groups that are providing assistance. Uh, just yesterday, more than 400 trucks were cleared to go into Gaza, and that is the most since October 7th in any given day. But what matters is results and sustained results, and this is what we will be looking at very carefully in the days ahead. Uh, and that includes making sure that the assistance that gets into Gaza is distributed effectively throughout Gaza, not just in the south or in central Gaza. It has to get to the north as well. Um, of course, we have our own citizens who remain hostage in Gaza, held by Hamas. Uh, we continue to work very closely with Israel, with Egypt, with uh, Qatar, uh, on getting an agreement that will result in an immediate ceasefire and the release of hostages and also create even better conditions for surging assistance to those who need it uh, in Gaza. Uh, two other quick things I wanted to touch on. In the Indo-Pacific, our two countries are aligned um, on the key issues before us in the Indo-Pacific, ensuring peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait, South China Sea. Okay, the Korean we're, listen, uh, listen, standing up. words, okay. Um, how we're doing right now when it comes to Taiwan, I would be very afraid if I was Taiwan of how lack of aid to Ukraine is going and China is just watching. That's all they're doing. They're like, hey, let's see how the United States responds to Russia's invasion. Oh, they're going to give up after like two years? <laughs> okay. Listen, um, words. The, the actions for Ukraine show us that, man, Taiwan, that's, that's tough. And how are you going to get Americans to get on board with aiding that if, if you can't even get the majority of Americans to be on board with supporting Ukraine? When the PRC is engaged in unfair trade practices. Just China will invade Taiwan. It's going to happen. And these words and strong actions, unless something drastically happens to change the course of how we're aiding Ukraine or how shitty we are, China's going to invade Taiwan. We'll have to we'll have China Taiwan coverage. We'll be supportive of Taiwan, but when it comes to military aid to Taiwan and and aid, don't expect it nearly as close as you were even seeing with Ukraine, which is very sad to say because we're barely even helping Ukraine. Uh, Non-market practices, including addressing the global economic consequences. Of Chinese industrial overcapacity uh, and the need for a level playing field. Secretary Yellen spoke very clearly and forcefully to this during her recent trip to China. This is an ongoing concern for our countries and for many other countries around the world. And of course, we have our AUKUS uh, agreement, modernizing partnerships to meet future challenges to promote a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, 
Australia's selection last month of British companies to develop nuclear-powered submarines is a milestone in actually integrating our defense industrial bases. Uh, we also discussed uh, partnerships with other countries uh, through AUKUS, including one that we'll discuss with Japan when Prime Minister Kishida is here uh, this week. Uh, and having uh, partners engaged, particularly in Pillar 2 uh, activities, uh, is something that will carry uh, this, uh, this partnership forward. Finally, we're working together in this hemisphere to address shared interests and uh, to try to advance peace, security, and opportunity. Uh, I welcome the conversations that we had about that as well. With that, David, let me turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Tony. It's very good to be back in Washington. Very good to be back with you. Um, in a time of danger like this in international affairs, close alliances really matter. And there is no closer alliance for us than our partnership with the United States. And I think the work we've been doing here and in NATO and what we'll be doing at the G7 really demonstrates that. On Ukraine, I want to echo what Tony said. Put simply, we know what works, we know what they need, and we know what is right for us. In terms of what works, we know that if we give the Ukrainians the support they deserve, they can win this war, they can achieve the just peace that they deserve. They've sunk 25% of Russia's Black Sea fleet. They've inflicted over 350,000 casualties on uh, Russian armed forces who launched this unprovoked and unjustified um, aggression. And we know that if we keep on backing them, we can lead this to the right conclusion. And we know what they need. We know they need air defenses. The Ukrainian foreign minister was so clear about that uh, in NATO. We know they need ammunition. There's the excellent Czech initiative to bring forward ammunition. That's going to arrive in June. And even before that, Britain is taking action to source more ammunition for them uh, in the run-up to that. We know that they need support from NATO allies and a good outcome to the NATO summit, which we were discussing this morning. And we know that they need money in the form of the frozen Russian sovereign assets. And we're making good progress in how to access that funds on an agreed basis that I think we can take forward at the G7. And of course, in terms of the money they need and the support they need, perhaps nothing is more important than the supplemental that the Congress is looking at at the moment. And I come here with um, no intention to lecture anybody or tell anybody what to do or get in the way of the process of politics and other things in the United States. I just I think that's exactly what we need. No, I think that's exactly what's needed. I think you need we need somebody that's not American, that's a leader. Like, it's sad, but um, we're at a point where you, you're not, we can't look to one American now as like a leader because we're cucked. We're cucked in domestic culture war politics that this is because of this is because of this and because of my feelings and because of my individualism and because I'm just an individual. I'm a special person out here. That's the United States. That's Americans. Okay. I, I noticed that when I went to Ukraine and there are Americans with us in the convoy that were just doing shit. I just like, well, we're in the, we're in the base in Kiev and they're just walking around and I'm like, bro, what are you doing? Like, why are you walking? Where are you going over there for? We can't go over there. Like, just doing whatever the fuck they want, basically. And you got the the, the individuals from the Baltic states and Ukraine going, that's Americans doing just individuals because we are. We're, we're told we're special. We have individual rights and freedoms, and we're just so special. We're special out here. Okay. That's just how Americans feel. Um, but we need somebody from, I don't know, somewhere to say, yo, um, Americans need to support Ukraine. Like, this needs to happen. And I'm sure Americans will push back at it and be like, who are you to tell us what to do? Because <laughs> we're special. <laughs> but um, yeah, we need somebody to not play bureaucracy and, oh, okay, guys. Well, it's just, oh, okay. No, we need like a strong leader here to say, yo, Ukraine's being invaded. We got to give Ukraine everything we need. It was looking like Macron was going to be that guy for a little bit there. I don't know what happened, but it sounded like Macron was going to be there. It doesn't seem like so now. We'll see how things go. But we really need a Western leader to step up here. Someone. Come here as a great friend and believer of, in this country and a believer that it's profoundly in your interests uh, and your security and your future and the future of all your partners to release this money and, and let it through. And I'm looking forward to meetings I'm going to ha be having in Congress um, later today. And above all, we know what's right for us. We know that it is right to stop Putin's aggression. We know it's right for our own militaries and our own production bases to ramp up production not just for Ukraine, but for our own stocks. And as Tony said, so many of the jobs created will be jobs created here in the United States, and indeed, when we're dealing with our own weapon systems, jobs 
in the UK. We know it's right to send this very clear message to all those watching around the world, including China, that we stand by our allies, that we don't reward aggression, that we help those who are trying to fight it off. And we know it's right for our own security. That leads to the NATO conference. We had some excellent discussions. I remember chairing the NATO summit in Wales in 2014. Back then, only three countries met the two percentage points of GDP on defense spending. I'm proud to say Britain was one of them. We're now up to around 20 countries out of an alliance of 32 members. And I think we can make real progress between now and the summit in Washington with every country showing how they're going to get uh, from where they are now to that 2%. And I would urge all those countries to think about how they can um, do it. And we'd also be looking at this mission for Ukraine um, about how NATO can do more to coordinate and help that country in its struggle. On our discussions on Israel... Oh, we've heard about that with NATO is they're trying to come up with their own fund. NATO's trying to come up with... So that way they don't have to w rely on U.S. Congress for big money spending for, to, to help defend Ukraine. Come up there with their own NATO package, Gaza, which I feel like should have been a thing. You got big NATO alliance, and an attack on one is attack on all. But you look to the United States for like the majority of the aid. Yeah, we're rich. We got a lot of money, but it's like that that organization should have its own funds and it should have its own ability to support um, when it's needed to. I said at the weekend we see this in in four very clear ways. One, we back the hostages and their families who are now in day 185 of their appalling captivity. We go hard on getting aid into Gaza. It's the right thing to do. And what was previously seen as impossible is now possible, and that is hugely welcome. We want to see that followed up. Uh, we believe in leading internationally, both at the United Nations, where we achieved a good um, resolution on a temporary ceasefire during um, uh, Ramadan, and also putting together countries that back and support a future peace process, such as met in Munich, and we hope we'll meet again um, shortly. But the fourth part of our plan is to support Israel and its legitimate right of self-defense to deal with the Hamas threat. And it's important we maintain um, that support. On aid, just to be clear, as Tony said, we want to see 500 trucks a day. We want to see the water switch back on. We want to see Ashdod and a northern crossing point opened. And crucially, we want to see this deconfliction because getting aid to Gaza on its own isn't enough. You've got to be able to get aid around Gaza. And as we saw with the tragic killing of the World Central Kitchen workers, unless you have that deconfliction, other things like that could um, happen. We have a very clear plan A for how we bring this conflict to an end. We have a temporary pause. We turn that into a sustainable ceasefire. We see Hamas leaders removed from Gaza. We see the terrorist infrastructure taken down. That is the way to have a political process that brings the war to an end. But we have to be aware if that doesn't work, we have to think about what is plan B. What can humanitarian and other organizations do to make sure that if there is a conflict in Rafah, that people can achieve safety, they can get food, they can get water, they can get medicine and people are kept safe. And I think that's something we're going to have to be looking at and we were talking about. Hey, right now, Israel goes into Rafa, boy, the reputation is just going to go down. Like more people, like might not, they're not going to maybe jump on the, on the, in there, but their view of Israel is likely just going to go downhill as it has been for weeks now. Um, today. Finally, on the other things you mentioned, I totally agree that AUKUS is a really important alliance. Uh, and I think one of the ways we can make it a success as well as making sure we build our submarines and invest on time, is making progress on the ITAR regulations. If we're going to have a partnership as close as this between three like-minded countries, we must be able to have the free flow. You know what the date is that they're going into, Rafa? Munitions between us. Finally, I just wanted to mention Haiti, um, where Secretary Blinken has... What's the date set for it? Forward ...and help. Um, Britain uh, has a number of priorities in that region, including neighboring countries that we are responsible for. But nonetheless, we will be providing over £5 million, $7 million to the fund to help support Haiti. So on these areas and many others, we've had an excellent conversation, an excellent meeting, um, and uh, it shows how like-minded we are on trying to make progress on these difficult conflicts that are so disrupting and disturbing our um, world. And we're determined to work together very closely as we do that. Thank you. Thank you. The first question goes to Olivia Gazis with CBS News. Question time. Thank you very much. Uh, and good morning. Secretary Blinken, there's been a spate of developments in Gaza that we're hoping you could shed some light for us on. First, Prime Minister Netanyahu has made public pronouncements about a date being set for an offensive in Rafah. Has the U.S. been apprised of such a date? And have, has it been given word of any accompanying plans by Israel uh, to ensure the safety of civilians there? My bad. I should have just waited a second. Thank you, Nance. Buying another hot dog. Appreciate that. Second, you mentioned the increase of the number of trucks being permitted into Gaza on a daily basis, but aid agencies, including the UN, are still saying that much less than the minimum amount of aid required is actually getting where it needs to go. So is Israel really doing enough, quickly enough, 
in order to forestall changes in U.S. policy, as the President and you have made clear. Foreign Secretary Cameron, you've come to Washington from a meeting in Florida with the former President and current presidential candidate, Donald Trump. We understand that aid to Ukraine was a key item on the agenda. First, do you come away from that meeting uh, more or less assured that U.S. aid to Ukraine is forthcoming in the near term? And second, did you achieve any clarity on Mr. Trump's reported plans to bring the war in Ukraine to an end? Specifically, did you receive any assurances that it would not involve territorial concessions by Kyiv? And with your indulgence for both of you, just given the bleak indications out of Cairo Jeez. today, Rachel Goldberg Poland, who's the mother of Hirsch, one of the hostages who's been held in Gaza for now more than six months, said recently, I feel that all the parties at the table have failed to include the governments at the table. Do you disagree with her? Thank you. So you got like an Israel question for Blinken, you got Ukraine question when he met with Trump for David Cameron, and then a personal question about a personal story for Blinken, or for both of them, it seems. Uh, Olivia, I'm happy to start. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the new iteration of asking questions of each of us and then asking a joint question at the end. This is a new model that I'm sure your colleagues will carry forward as well. Um, on Rafa, uh, no, we do not have a, a date for any Rafa operation, at least one that's been communicated to us by the Israelis. On the contrary, what we have is an ongoing conversation with Israel about um, any Rafa operation. Um, the President's been very clear about our concerns, our deep concerns, uh, about Israel's ability to move civilians out of, harm, out of harm's way, uh, to uh, care for them once they're out of harm's way, and to have uh, any kind of major military operation that doesn't do um, real harm to uh, civilians, to children, to women, to men. Um, we are committed uh, to uh, ensuring that um, Hamas cannot Governor, dictate the future of Gaza or anything else uh, for that matter. But how uh, Israel conducts any further uh, operations in Gaza uh, matters a great deal. And as we've said, we're talking to them about um, alternative and, uh, in our judgment, effective ways at solving a problem that needs to be solved, but doing it in a way that does not endanger uh, the, uh, the innocent. Uh, those conversations are ongoing. My expectation is that we'll see um, uh, Israeli colleagues again uh, next week uh, to, uh, to pursue that. With regard to the uh, assistance that, uh, that is getting in, uh, look, we've been, again, very clear starting with the president. We need to see the, not just the commitments, not just the implementation of the commitments, but actual results and results that are sustained and sustained throughout Gaza, not only in the south or in central Gaza. So I mentioned that yes, yes, uh, yesterday, by our count, more than 400 trucks were cleared, uh, which is um, double what had been happening uh, heretofore. Uh, that's, that's important, but it's just one step. And again, it needs to be sustained. David referred to a number of other steps that, um, uh, that Israel has either committed to or has already begun to take. And I mentioned some of them as well. Uh, opening an additional crossing uh, in the north, uh, maximizing the route uh, from Jordan, um, maximizing what is uh, being screened at, uh, at Karim Shalom uh, and at Rafah, uh, fixing the um, water pipelines in the north, uh, central and, and southern Gaza. This is critical. Uh, and so important, um, putting in place a deconfliction mechanism so that humanitarians can go about their work throughout Gaza without fearing for their security and safety. Isn't like the, so that we know listen, that. haven't, Jake, haven't these been the words for months now? I feel like we have been hearing this like, I mean, again, we're not closely tracking um, Israel's war in Gaza. Like, we're not. And obviously, just the current events. And we talked about the World Central Kitchen workers being killed. I feel like every press conference we're hearing is like we were asking Israel to chill out, basically. We're doing everything we can to make sure Israel doesn't just kill everybody, is what I'm basically what I'm getting from a majority of this, like during the time we do. And it's just constant. Like every month, we're doing everything we can to make sure Israel's abiding by humanitarian law and international order and not killing non-combatants. And it never ends. And now they got an upcoming operation in Rafa. Oh, man. The horrific um, loss with the attack on the World Central Kitchen a team just uh, a week or so ago. So this is, this is a work very much in progress. And as I say, we will judge it by its results and by whether they're sustained. Uh, but the commitments that have been, that have been made um, and the initial steps to implement those commitments are positive, but a lot more needs to happen uh, to make sure that people in Gaza have what they need. I don't think Israel is going to listen to one bit of that. They haven't thus far. Why would they now when they're at the end, right? Just being real. Like, why would Israel listen at all at this point, right, when they're at the very end? They're going to go into their groff and do whatever they want, like they have been this whole time. It's just words to them. That's, that's what it is. Just words, 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 nothing else, nothing more. Just words. Because it's the same thing. There would be change. Like, if there would be something different, but there's nothing different. It's the same situation. Only they're at the very end now. Why is Israel, why do you think Israel would, think Israel's going to stop now? Um, on the issue of uh, my meeting with President Trump, this was entirely in line with precedent of uh, government ministers meeting with 
Um, yeah, but the Netanyahu doesn't even listen to the own Israeli people that are in the streets protesting him. Like they're doing whatever they want right now. Position politicians in the run-up to elections. Uh, I remember when I was prime minister meeting Mitt Romney when he was a candidate. I remember Gordon Brown meeting Barack Obama um, uh, when he was a candidate. I think um, Tony, you recently had a meeting with Keir Starmer, the Labour leader in, in Munich. So these things are entirely proper. Um, but it was a private meeting, so I haven't really got anything to to add to your to your questions. But we discussed a range of important geopolitical subjects. And on, um, oh, on hostages, Afghanistan and Gaza are the same size. Hostages, yes, yeah. I would just say um, that we're doing everything we can to help. There are um, two British nationals, but others with British connections. So we're doing everything we can. I, I would just make the point that ultimately the people responsible for holding these hostages are Hamas. They could release the hostages now. Um, I'm not involved in the minutiae of the negotiations, but I know you know very big offers have been made by Israel to release loads of prisoners from their prisons in response to hostages being released and you know we need the hostages to come home uh, we need the aid to get in and it's a mass more than anyone else that are standing in the way of that happening um, and I would just add that um, I know Rachel well if I were sitting in her shoes I'd undoubtedly be feeling <coughs> and saying the same thing because until the day that Hirsch is home um, we will not have succeeded in doing what we're determined to do which is to bring him and bring all the hostages back we have our, our teams working on this 24-7. We're working, as you know, closely with uh, Qatar, with Egypt, with Israel. Um, Bill Burns has been doing extraordinary work um, on this. Um, many of us have been deeply, uh, deeply engaged working with the, uh, with the governments in question. Uh, we have an offer that's on the table now to Hamas that is very serious and um, should be accepted. Is David Cameron going to answer the question about meeting with Trump yet? Um, Hamas could move forward with this immediately and get a ceasefire that would benefit people throughout Gaza as well as, of course, get the hostages home. Uh, I think uh, the fact that it continues to not say yes is a reflection of what it really thinks about the people of Gaza, uh, which is not much at all. Uh, it's also extraordinary the extent to which Hamas has been almost erased from this, this story. Um, as we both said, going back almost to day one, uh, none of what we've seen in, in Gaza um, would have uh, happened had Hamas given up the hostages right away, put down its weapons, stopped hiding behind civilians and surrendered. Um, it has an opportunity now. But then why would Israel continue building settlements on the West Bank, though? If it wasn't, if that's all it was, it was just about killing, uh, whatever. To whatever. agree to the proposal. I don't want to be an anti-Semite, my bad. On hostages. The ball was in Hamas's court. The world is watching to see what it does. Felicia Schwartz with the Financial Times. Thank you. Um, Secretary Blinken, um, are you confident that the talks in Washington on Rafa will happen before Israel does go into Rafa and that they will follow your advice when doing so? Um, and on assistance, um, how long does Israel have to sustain the aid that you spoke about or risk consequences? And do you agree with Foreign Secretary Cameron that there needs to be a plan B? And what do you think that should be? Um, Foreign Secretary Cameron, you said before coming to the US that you would encourage Speaker Johnson to get Ukraine aid through the House, but now you are not seeing him. Um, William Johnson in the chat says you effing traitor you're a disgrace to the armed forces you sicken me to my stomach i lost good friends downrange caps dirtbag andy please stop obsessing about trump i think if you repeat that you'll you might get a personal one-on-one -on -one meeting with trump and then you can ask him on a date william i think good luck with that though i think you can ask trump out if you keep up that effort why is that and have you left your meeting with president trump if anything you'll get a maga that'll be into you that's for sure Believing that he will uh give johnson the green light to make that vote happen uh, Felicia, let me take the second part first, uh, which is on aid and how long does it need to be sustained. <laughs> it needs to be sustained as long as necessary to ensure that the people of Gaza have what they need uh, to get by and uh, sustained as, as long as um, it takes to put in place something more permanent when uh, this conflict comes to an end uh, that can guarantee that people are getting what they need. Did and, Cameron and, answer the question on Trump? And to rebuild uh, Gaza. So there's no, um, there's no date certain at all. This needs to not only happen, not only need to be sustained, but it just needs to continue as long as it's necessary to provide for people in Gaza. It's as simple and as straightforward as that. Uh, and again, with regard to Rafa, I don't want to prejudge any uh, the, these, these ongoing talks. Um, and uh, I can tell you that, again, we expect to have a continuation of those talks next week. I don't anticipate uh, any actions being taken uh, before uh, those talks. Uh, and for that matter, I don't, uh, don't see anything imminent. But um, there is a lot of work to be done, and it remains our conviction that um, major military operations in, uh, in Rafa uh, would um, be extremely uh, dangerous for um, civilians who would be caught in, uh, in harm's way. That as we share the commitment to dealing with the, the problem posed by Hamas, we believe there are other effective ways to do it. That's going to be the subject of these ongoing conversations. I don't want to prejudge what the outcome will be. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be going to the Hill. I've got a range of meetings with 
uh, senators and congressmen on both sides of the aisle. Um, I always do this with great trepidation. It's not for foreign politicians to tell legislators in another country what to do. It's just that I'm so passionate about uh, the importance of defending Ukraine against this aggression that I think it is absolutely the interests of U.S. security uh, that Putin fails in his illegal invasion. I think it's good for U.S. jobs uh, that we continue to back uh, Ukraine with the weapons that they need. And I think in terms of how the United States and the United Kingdom as allies are seen around the world, um, there will be people in Tehran, in Pyongyang, in Beijing looking at how we stand by our allies, how we help them, how we stop this uh, illegal and unprovoked aggression, and working out whether we are committed, whether we're prepared to see it through. They're so not just sitting back and watching. They're being proactive and destabilizing our countries, David Cameron. They're not just sitting and watching. They're like, okay, we're all, we're going to sit and watch and observe, but at the same time, we're also going to, with agents of our own countries, um, political money moves so that way this they won't pass bills to help Ukraine or then we'll we'll help Russia and then see how US responds and they're not responding so that'll help us in the future against Taiwan and they're 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 not just sitting and watching they're being proactive Russia's interfered with American elections since 2016 fact fact and it's only going to be worse this year you can only imagine like all China Iran and Russia will be involved in in trying to overthrow our elections or not overthrow them, but um, influence our elections. Okay, it's it's over with for, on that aspect, and thus we get serious serious things in place to prevent it. But then you're gonna have people crying about free speech. So I think we're really cucked. Um, I wish I had more hopeful for the situation, but at the same time, the those countries aren't being they're not just sitting back and watching. They are actively destabilizing our countries as we speak. I'm here to offer my opinion, to meet with anyone who wants to talk to me about it, um, to make those arguments. Um, and I think the perspective, I always encourage others in, in Europe, particularly perhaps those right up against the fence with Russia, who, can, who feel the Russian aggression, who, who feel the fear of it. Um, and I think, as I said at the NATO summit last week, it, it's so important um, that the outcome of all this is a secure and strong NATO with full US and Atlantic support, rather than a setback for the Western alliance, a victory for Putin, and a sense that we don't stand by our allies and our friends at their time of need. So that's the spirit in which I'm here. I'm delighted to have a whole series of meetings this afternoon and some more tomorrow, and I'll make time for any um, people in Congress who, who, who would welcome a conversation about this. Tom Bateman with the BBC. West Bank's under attack. Why, there's no military operations there, but yet Israel keeps building settlements there and put Americans there too as well. Thank you very much. Just fuck. Uh, Secretary Blinken, first of all, the BBC spoke uh, last week to the parents of Jacob Flickinger, who was the uh, US Canadian citizen who was killed in the uh, World Central Kitchen uh, Israeli airstrike. Um, his okay. wife describes the convoy as being chased down. Who've been stepping up to, uh, to support this effort. It means a great deal. Thank you. Um, thanks. On Israel and international okay. killers of British and American hostages in the Syrian desert. Jihad Dozens of words. Terrorists. Many people who have been waving white flags and have still been shot down by IDF forces. I mean, where was the outrage then? And why then didn't you offer to, to reshape American policy if necessary? Why only now? Is it just the, the passports that these seven held? Okay, um, first of all, um, on my dinner, I'm not going to relent from the fact that it was a private dinner, but we discussed geopolitical issues like Israel and Gaza, like Ukraine, uh, like the future of NATO. Um, look, whoever I'm talking to, I tend to make the same points, which is that you know, we've got to do everything we can this year um, to get NATO in its strongest possible shape for its 75th anniversary and getting everyone up to 2%, uh, having the new members joining Sweden and Finland, having the strongest possible alliance, that's the best thing we can do on Ukraine. The best thing we can do this year is to help keep the Ukrainians in this fight. They're fighting so bravely, they're not going to lose for want of morale. Uh, the danger is we don't give them the support that they need. And I make that argument to anyone who will um, listen to me. I argue that it is uh, extremely good value for money for the United States and for others. Um, perhaps for about 5 or 10% of your defense budget, almost half of Russia's pre-war military equipment has been destroyed. For, without the loss of a single uh, American life. This is an investment in United States security. Um, so that's what I would say. On the issue of legal advice, I think it is an important principle um, that legal advice is not published, um, that ministers consider it and act in a way that is consistent with it. Uh, we answer questions about it, as I am now, as I will be in the House of Lords, I'm sure, next week, and I've got a question time on Tuesday, but probably a statement as well, and it's right that we answer those questions. We have published summaries of legal advice, but that has been when we've been sending British troops into action, as we did uh, in Libya, or as we did recently when we um, sent British um, Air Force personnel into combat uh, with the Houthis. I think that's a different situation, a summary of legal advice published in those circumstances. I don't think it's right in these circumstances, and I say we act consistent with it, we're happy to answer questions about it, we're very clear about the deep concern we have about the humanitarian aid situation, but the overall judgment is those export licenses will remain open and continue. Uh, didn't even answer the question. I'm sorry, but didn't answer it. I was waiting. Um, the question was about Israel killing journalists, which has happened, and um, you didn't call them out back then when journalists were being killed, and why are you doing it now when you could have been doing it then? 
Great, great. I'm glad he's strong for you. I mean, it's like crazy. It's like, are they even strong for Ukraine? Strong with their words. Strong with their words for sure, but the actions aren't even following. So they just deflected to, we're strong for Ukraine and we're a coalition and we're all the warriors and members of a team for Ukraine. Remember? <laughs> Stop with these Israel questions. <laughs> this is how it is. But here's the good news, okay? We don't need to, the rest of it sounds like it's just about Israel. So we're just going to stick to this because we can talk about Israel for hours, but we're not going to. The U.S. sends Ukraine seize Iranian-made weapons. Okay, so we got something to Ukraine. Pentagon has provided Ukraine with thousands of Iranian origin weapons seized en route in the Houthi militants in Yemen, U.S. officials said Tuesday, marking the Biden administration's latest infusion of emergency support for Kyiv, while the multi-billion dollar aid package remains stalled in Congress. Thank you for reminding me. I gotta turn down the um I gotta turn back on the filter quick. Because if I don't, it'll be very loud and you guys are gonna have a problem. Because we're gonna have Greg on here shortly to get the full frontline update. The weapons include 5,000 AKs, machine guns, sniper rifles, rocket propelled grenades, along with half a million rounds of ammo. They were discovered aboard four stateless vessels between 2021 and in 2023 and made available for Ukraine through a Justice Department civil forfeiture program targeting Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, according to U.S. Central Command, which oversees military operations in the Middle East. Here's that post. And this is the news update on it, but here is... Um, did I save their... Let me see here. U.S. Central Command. They tweeted about it. They gave an update. CENTCOM. Where? There we go. On April 4th, 2024, the U.S. government transferred 5,000 AKs, machine guns, temper, I read that, um, over 500,000 rounds of 7.62 ammo to the Ukrainian armed forces. This constitutes, this, uh, constitutes enough material to equip one Ukrainian brigade with small arms rifles. These weapons will help Ukraine defend against Russia's invasion. The government obtained ownership of these munitions on December 1st, through the Department of Justice civil forfeiture claims against Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. These munitions were originally seized by the U.S. Central Command and partner naval forces from four separate transitioning, excuse me, transiting stateless vessels between 22 May of 2021 and 15 February of 2023. The munitions are being transferred from the IRGC to the Houthis in Yemen in violation of the United Nations Security Council resolution in 2216. The U.S. CENTCOM is committed to working with our allies and partners to counter the flow of Iranian lethal aid in the region by all means, including U.S. and U.N. sanctions through interdictions. Iran's support for armed groups threatens international and regional security, our forces, diplomatic personnel, and citizens in the region, as well as those of our partners. We will continue to do whatever we can to shed light on and stop Iran's destabilizing activities. All right, so there's a move. So Iran's, I mean, Russia's sending Iranian drones with Iran at Ukrainian civilians, so it's used seized Iranian weapons to give to Ukraine to fight back with them. It's not a, it's not going to be a move that, you know, wins the war, but it's something. It's, it's ammo. It's, it's supplies that Ukraine desperately needs. They need artillery, though. They need long-range missiles, but... It's something that Biden administration's getting to them while we're waiting for, waiting for aid bills. Here's another one. U.S. to sell Ukraine 138 million in Hawk air defense upgrades. United States will sell Ukraine up to 138 million worth of equipment to maintain and upgrade its Hawk air defense systems to help against Russian drone and cruise missile attacks. The U.S. began shipping Hawk interceptor missiles into Ukraine in 2022 as an upgrade to the shoulder launch Stinger air defense missile systems, which is a smaller and shorter range system, as you guys know. Since then, Ukraine has received several air defense systems, including a U.S. made Patriot. Tuesday's emergency foreign military sales with as much as 138 million, the official said, speaking on condition of anonymity. Although Ukraine has run out of many sources of U.S. funds, he was given a grant of 300 million in 400, excuse me, in foreign military financing as part of the annual defense spending bill recently signed into law. The grant money will be used to pay for the equipment, which includes engineering and integration for, communi for communications and refurbishment of Hawk fire units. In addition, the sale requires missile recertification components for older units, tests, and support equipment, spare parts, and more, which is huge to have. I reiterate that point every time that Ukraine gets something. They need the, su the support 
They need the parts to it. They need the maintenance for it. All of the, it's not just like here's a tank, Ukraine or whatever. They need all of the support, maintenance, and ability to make sure that tank or whatever that defense system is maintained. The sale will require a temporary duty travel to Europe of an estimated five U.S. government employees and 15 contractors to represent to support training and sustainment. Presidential drawdown authority has been used previously to transfer Hawk equipment to Ukraine. The provision allows the United States to transfer defense articles and services from American stocks quickly without congressional approval in response to an emergency. So isn't this like, isn't this what like all of the, the right wing bitching on Twitter has been about? Isn't this what all the, this dude, there's been, they're, they're going crazy. This guy, this guy, Colin Bodwar, a lot of people on Twitter like this guy. He must have some good takes for Ukraine, but. Um, yeah, he did a 109 tweet thread about how it's really Joe Biden's fault and they should be using the presidential drawdown authority for weapons to Ukraine. And it's just actually not the Republicans. 109. Okay. Well, and a day later, I guess they're selling Hawk equipment to it. Maybe the tweet went somewhere. Maybe how many views did it get? Did it get enough? 2 million. Eh, maybe. Maybe it did. Maybe it didn't. I don't know. But we already got presidential drawdown authority funds and Hawk systems going the next day. The MIM-23 Hawk, a name. Oh, we actually could just get a, a video update. And then we're going to get Greg in here. This will be a good transition from military weapons to what's happening on the front lines. Okay, but this is new stocks of it. Analysis defense. So you got to find a good channel for this. New Mexico Museum of Space History. This is eight months ago. U.S. Defense News. The U.S. is buying back decommissioned MIMM-23 Hawk missile systems sold to Taiwan to provide to Ukraine as part of a new military aid package. Understand? Now this they're replenishing this now. So that, like the Ukraine got these already, but they need the supplies, they need the missiles, they need all the equipment for this. So that's what Ukraine's getting. In this new one and yeah, they're getting to, to resupply these already existing hawk missiles that we've already given them but this is a video about what they are air defense has played a crucial role in the russian ukraine war with both sides vying to control the airspace by deploying advanced air defense systems recent news articles highlight these state-of-the-art systems such as the patriot air defense system successfully intercepting a russian hypersonic weapon and russian electronic warfare systems countering 10,000 ukrainian drones monthly Therefore, it is somewhat surprising that a recent aid package from the U.S. to Ukraine included the MIM-23 Hawk Air Defense Artillery System. Developed by the U.S. in 1959 wow. and phased out of service in the 1990s, Whoa. the Hawk system is considered outdated. Nonetheless, it will provide Ukraine with an advantage in controlling its airspace. Why haven't we given Ukraine like all of those? We don't even, we don't even use them anymore. The newspaper's source states that it is about the Phase II MIM-23 Hawk decommissioned in June. Consultations between the U.S. and Taiwanese governments preceded the purchase agreement. SAM's surface-to-air missiles, ED, will be transferred to the Ukrainian army to combat Russian drones and low-altitude aircraft. Taiwan's Ministry of National Defense declined Taiwan News' request for comment, but said regulations were disposing of the weapons. Taiwan will replace the decommissioned weapons with a Skybell II TK-3 system. Initially, the system was developed to destroy aircraft, but later modified to intercept missiles. They were in service with a large number of European countries, including Greece, the Netherlands, France, Germany, and others. The government-funded public television service in Taipei said if the repurchase plan was confirmed and the appropriate launch systems were acquired, Ukraine could use the weapons, assuming they were still in good condition. Citing an unnamed Taiwanese military source, the island's China Times newspaper reported that Taipei and Washington had discussed the idea during a recent security meeting about what to do with the hundreds of missiles after they were decommissioned. Damn, that's what, that's what Taiwan has, huh? Purchase most of the systems and send them to Ukraine to reinforce its air defense, the source told China Times following the meeting. On Monday, the island's defense ministry declined to confirm or deny such a plan. Still, it said, all weapons which are decommissioned and disposed of by the military must comply with relevant regulations. The reported plan to send the missiles yeah to i think at one point we're gonna start just going full scale um industrialization for military equipment here soon or how long do you think the west maybe that could be a poll question if i can think of a good way to frame it uh, frame it 
How long do you think the West and the United States and others are going to be scrapping to find random weapon systems? Or when do you think the do you think the West or NATO countries are going to just go in and start producing like we should be? In my opinion, there's no way that Russia as a country is just mass producing armaments right now, like on a scale that Ukraine can't keep up with, and we're just like not. We're not. We're 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 scrapping to find weapons in other countries and do like third party deals like hey we'll give you a new patriot if you give ukraine this old shit type like like nba draft or nba trades or for, for example like a trade to a trade at some point i feel the u.s and western countries are gonna have to boy job and that's some jobs sure it's for weapon parts weapon systems but you got countries that are trying to destroy us that are destroying ukraine and we're not doing anything in a serious matter to be ready for that at least i haven't heard maybe i'm hoping we are I'm hoping that we are low key and I just don't know about it. All right. I'm just ignorant to it. But at the same time, you kind of think that that would make the news if the U.S. industry started changing to producing artillery and producing Patriot systems and getting that going here. Ukraine to help deter attacks from Moscow has led to. Sure, yeah, union jobs. It's it is jobs. Taiwan might become a Russian target. Maybe I'll, I'll put that into a poll. At altitudes up to 20 kilometers, 12.4 miles. And if they strike something that Russia cares about, Taiwan could become one of its revenge targets. Warned political commentator and former lawmaker Julian Gu. He said the U.S. has been purchasing older, outdated conventional weapons from other allies, and it would not be surprising to see similar offers made to Taiwan. Wang Hunwei, a lawmaker of the main opposition Kuomintang Party, said that since the U.S. is Taiwan's biggest unofficial ally, it is unlikely Taiwan would be able to say no if Washington asked to repurchase the missiles. To prevent us from becoming a target, we should make sure that the repurchased weapons are provided by the United and States. It's like, bro, it's a, it's a win, it'd be a win-win, wouldn't it? Because say, oh my, listen, maybe I'm making too much sense. Say that that Russia backs down then because they see that the U.S. and the West is stepping up and producing artillery because we can do it better than they can um, in terms of the logistical aspect of it. I mean, we're not gonna we're not gonna turn our mail post offices into drone factories. Like that's not gonna happen. Like what Russia's doing, but um, uh, golly, I had a point there. I had a point there. Now I lost it. Regardless, whatever. I'm gonna put the poll in the chat. Ukraine instead of Taiwan, and they should not be considered as our military aid to Ukraine. Oh, she said. yeah, it's a win-win Jane. because say say nothing happens of it. Oh wow, now we just replenished our own stocks. We created American jobs, and say Taiwan in the future gets invaded, which I, they are going to. It seems by 2027, according to everybody. Wow, good thing we produced all this artillery and, and ammunition for Ukraine or for whatever. And now we don't have to go digging around uh, random places in the world for old, old, old weapon systems. Or like countries that we're allies with. Hey, can, we'll give you F-35 if you just give a little bit of artillery. Come on. We don't have to make stupid deals anymore. We already have all of it. We have stocks replenished. Like, I don't know why this isn't happening at all. Ting. And if it is, I really, I, I really hope it is. And I'm just ignorant. Really Hired do. Air Force Lieutenant General said that even though the missiles have been in Taiwan for 63 years, they still had a target accuracy rate of 90.4%, which would effectively boost Ukraine's resistance against Russian forces. Because the missiles have not only been well maintained but have also remained in good condition, the U.S. can swiftly deliver them to Ukraine without needing to spend time overhauling them, Chang said. Chang said that since Taiwan had already retired the Hawk missiles, the U.S. could repurchase them at an extremely low cost, while the island would not need to spend time and money on proper disposal of the weapons. According to an April legislative report from the island's defense ministry, the military originally planned to prepare a budget to have the National Chungshan Institute of Science and Technology destroy some 250 Hawk missiles by the end of this year. The Raytheon MIM-23 Hawk is an American medium-range surface-to-air missile. It was designed to be a much more mobile counterpart to the MIM-14 Nike Hercules, trading off range and altitude capability for a much smaller size and weight. Its low-level performance okay, I got the poll in the chat. greatly improved over Nike by adopting new radars and a continuous wave semi-active radar homing guidance system. It entered service with the U.S. Army in 1959. The Raytheon RTX 10.2% MIM-23 Hawk system, a median range. Which one exactly is it, though? Does it say which one they're actually getting? Probably not. Could be operational security for like what specific variant? It doesn't. It just. It doesn't say. Okay. Mobile air defense system is designed to engage multiple airborne threats simultaneously. It boasts a maximum engagement range of up to 40 kilometers and incorporates an advanced surveillance radar for target detection and tracking. 
the upgraded versions have approximately an 85% chance of intercepting a short-range tactical missile. Regarding operational use, several countries have used the Hawk system to protect critical assets, military bases, and deployed forces. The system underwent several upgrades over the past decades. However, the U.S. Army replaced the system with the Patriot system in 1994. The U.S. Marine Corps followed suit and transitioned to Stinger missiles in 2002. Nevertheless, the U.S. possesses a substantial stockpile of Hawk systems in its equipment graveyards, and several countries still procure and employ them. Thus, the like system Taiwan. is readily available for transfer to another country with minimal refurbishment. Moreover, providing another country with Hawk systems does not detract from the readiness of U.S. military units. Once Ukraine receives the Hawk systems, they can quickly deploy and utilize them as they are already trained. The Ukrainian military received Hawk systems from the Spanish Army earlier in the war, and the U.S. subsequently provided them with additional refurbished Hawk missiles. Ukrainian troops have been trained on these systems in Spain since late 2022, and likely, they are already in use in Ukraine. Shout out to Spain. All right, we got to get Ukraine Patriots though, okay? I'm glad that, listen, all of those, definitely, but Patriots. That's the newest one that we can that we have but I, if we have those old shit in stock i have no idea why ukraine just doesn't have those um yeah it's it's just the worst we, we continue to do deals for deals for deals and again like i continue to read right i really hope i'm just ignorant to the knowledge of um production of ammunition artillery systems defense systems like i hope that there's a plant in ohio or pennsylvania that's producing Patriot systems. You know, I really hope that there's not like a, a small amount of those that exist. I know they're expensive, but shit, dude, we produce them. All right, let's go to Greg. Let's go to Greg. All right, we got him on the call. And get him on in here on Discord. I'm gonna make sure you get my split cam so you can see me. There I am. All righty. Yeah, microphone check. I don't know if we can hear Greg yet. I think he has his mic turned off. But we'll get that fixed shortly. I'm coming. There he is. Check one, two. Check one, two. Let me get you on the screen. Make sure we're good to go. You can get both of us on there. That'd What's going on? All righty. Not much. How you doing, Greg? Welcome. Terry Tuesdays. You were just out, you were on a stream with um, Jonathan from ATP earlier. I'm doing well. Are you, are you hearing a delay on the mic? You, you hear me? Yeah. There's a little delay. Jonathan and I were rolling, man. It was a good stream. Jonathan rolled the front with me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing the delay? No, we're good. Go ahead. Hold on a second. Let's do this. Just want to make sure you're not hearing me on a delay. I think it should be. Check into the stream, you guys. Like no, the video. I don't hear you in the delay. Okay, like the video if you guys haven't. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're talking Are you real time with me right now? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I'm real time with you. I can hear you. Yep. Okay. I think we might Why be. Why am I having a delay? Are you hearing my? Are you hearing me through my stream and not through OBS proper? Or through Discord, I mean. Oh, you know what? <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> Wait a second. You had the audio muted? I've got 31 screens open over oh, here. Oh, my goodness. All fixed. <laughs> okay. Uh, it we're happens. good to go now. We, we're, we're golden. Good. All right. Greg Terry, everybody, from the Greg we're Terry golden. Experience YouTube channel. Tell we're, me you're live with me now. Oh, we're live with you now. We're live with you now. Testing. In Discord. In Discord, yep. So you're on delay there. One second. One second. Now, why am I not hearing you now? Uh-oh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh-oh. Should be. Let me make sure. Let me double check. It's second. my settings. One okay. second. I have to think. Technologies, guys. Microphone. Oh, there. you know why? Why's that? Try that now. Do I hear you now? Testing. Testing, testing. Wait a second. No, not yet. Do I hear you now? Do you hear me now? Okay. So, I we're good now, right? Okay. Okay, so sorry guys for all the technical difficulties there. So I I switched my um, audio unit and uh, I'm using a Rode 
podcaster duo, and it's so smart, it has a Discord channel. So I'm not a Discord user. Um, so I just learned that on the fly here. I remember reading it in the manual and we got it all dialed in. So we are plus plus on that. And I guess this segment, let's see if this works. Welcome to you. Got your sound. that work? Yeah, I heard that. Oh, we're having, hey, we're going to do, we're going we'll to stream like this. Got to have the sounds. Oh yeah. You got your sounds on. Yeah. So it's good. You guys. So this is Greg right, Terry. We're good. This is First, Greg Terry from the Greg Terry experience YouTube channel. Now that you've joined us, we're going to go through right, look, the map. Yeah. We're going to do that. We're going to go through the map. I do want to say a couple things on the things you were talking about. Sure. Uh, first of all, the gentleman that called you out about being a trader. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, if you're going to use the English language and say, you're a traitor. It's actually not Y O U R. It's Y O U apostrophe R E, meaning you are a traitor. My trolls aren't so, the most educated. No, we got that figured out. That was definitely a goofy troll there. So just having fun with that one. I couldn't help it. I was listening, working on other stuff, and I said, hold on, I got to see what's in the chat there. And uh, I saw it. I said, oh, you can't even spell right. All right. <laughs> so that's good there. Uh, I've shared it there. Secondly, Hawk Systems. Mm. This is a good place to play. I sent you a video in our private chat okay. um, from Lloyd Austin. That is today. So the Hawk Systems, guys, is not for new systems. Additionally, the Hawk is not for new supply. I've seen the Hawks there, okay? This is just for maintenance and repair. There are no new weapon systems coming with this. This is not about new missiles. This is about sending a team of American contractors there, okay. finding and purchasing the supplies that are necessary to repair, refurbish, and upgrade. After that, then we have to talk about uh, further supplying of Hawk missiles. They still have some Hawk missiles, not many, mm -hmm. but this is more about repairing the units. Okay. Um, so 138 million mm -hmm. for that, which is good. We're thankful for that. We're thankful that they're repairing those units. Um, so it's better than zero. Um, additionally, on Cameron, uh, Cameron went and met with Trump. And um, it, it, it's, it's so strange, dude. It, it, <laughs> I know. Okay. I don't know why it's a secret right. or why he had to make, not talk about what was said. I don't know why it has to be a secret. Well, nothing was said. So let me let, let let's do a little bit of analysis. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Um the reason he never answered the question. I've been listening to your whole stream. Mm -hmm. The reason he never answered the question mm -hmm. is because he got smoked at Donald Trump's. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump is a narcissist. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump, if reelected, will not make America great again. He will destroy our nation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I am a Reagan Republican. My picture is my little Reagan's right over there on the wall, all lit up my mm -hmm. little altar to Ronnie. Um, but I want you guys to remember something. First of all, let's, let's regardless of opinions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Donald Trump is not a stupid person and Donald Trump's brain works. And if you have wronged him, he will never forget it. So I have a video clip, Andrew, that I keep locked in my software and, and um, that I pull out occasionally. Mm -hmm. And I have it of Vladimir Putin about six or eight months ago. And he is being interviewed. And the interviewer asked him in Russian, is there, are, are you a person that is able to forgive? And Vladimir Putin answered, yes, I am a person that can forgive. And then the, the interviewer asked, is there anything you cannot forgive? And these comments were right around the time of Prigozhin, mm -hmm. okay, when he was taken out. Um, and Vladimir Putin's answer was, yes, there is one thing I can never forgive, and that is betrayal. I will never forgive betrayal. I think that when you get into a narcissistic mind of a dictator and whether you look back in history and it's Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini, just for the 20th century. And then we move into modern day 
Vladimir Putin. You can even look at smaller uh, pictures of this, even during the time of like Saddam Hussein, et cetera, et cetera, when these guys are having di dictatorial powers. And like it or love it or disagree or not agree, this is the way Donald Trump's mind operates, okay? And BBC released an article that talked about um, David Cameron, Lord Cameron, visiting um, Trump. And the BBC, it, it says this, Lord Cameron repeatedly dismissed, question, dismissed questions asking him to divulge the details of his earlier meeting with Donald Trump, which he only answered it was a private meeting. Um, and then he said there is a precedent for foreign secretaries to visit presidential candidates in election years. That is correct. Okay, I do have a problem with him going to see Biden. I mean, uh, Trump and 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 not Biden. Right. You know, but I'm not in any of that anyway. But um, but Lord Cameron had previously criticized Mr. Trump. Mm. This is BBC. Lord Cameron had previously criticized Mr. Trump, who is the presumptive nominee for the Republican Party. Mr. Trump and his supporters within the party opposed the USAID package for Ukraine. Some in the House have voted against the package without additional funding for the U.S. borders, as you've been talking to for about a couple hours. Mm -hmm. Lord, Lord Cameron has been urging Republicans for some time to approve the aid package, particularly angling Republican Congresswoman and Trump loyalist Marjorie Taylor Greene, who previously told the foreign secretary to kiss my a double dollar sign. Moscow Marjorie. Really professional. Moscow yeah, that's Marjorie. really professional. Yes. She was responding to an article written by a foreign secretary in which he warned the U.S. against showing the weakness displayed against, at that time, Hitler. Okay. Um, in 2015, during his time as prime minister, Lord Cameron labeled Mr. Trump's proposed temporary ban on Muslims entering the U.S. as divisive, stupid, and wrong. I think if he came to visit our country, Lord Cameron said, I would unite us all against him. Mr. Trump replied by warning that he may not have a very good relationship with Mr. Cameron during his presidency. In his memoirs published in 2019, just five years ago, Lord Cameron further said that he found it depressing that Mr. Trump could win an election and that it was due to his protectionist, xenophobic, misogynistic interventions. That's all you need to know, guys. That's it. Donald Trump played David Cameron like a fool today. He will not say one word. He will not forget. That's the mentality of a, of a dictator. He, he remembers everything this man wrote about him in his memoirs, said about his presidency. Forget it. In fact, I would even suggest that the more Trump is pushed on by this, the further it will push him from helping. That's just the way he thinks. Mental wise, but I'm here to talk about Ukraine, not right. Donald Trump. Because David, David Cameron pushed back against him, and now it's like, absolutely, oh, he's, my, and, he's my enemy. That's right. Mm. So you think Trump now is going to gonna bow the knee? You think Trump now is going to humble himself and say, okay, let's evaluate this. It may be, okay, no, that's not going to happen. And why is that not going to happen? It's not going to happen because Donald Trump has already put his word out there that he can end the war in 24 hours. He will push the envelope for Ukraine to give up Eastern territory and Crimea, create a zone, war over, everybody go home. For, of course, that is so short-sighted and ignorant because that only will make things worse and will not end any war. It will just create another more. war. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the David Cameron deal. Um, but the Lloyd Austin clip, if you do not mind yeah, I was about to play playing that. that. Yeah. Okay, so the $138 million for the Hawk repair systems came out um, today. Mm -hmm. This was Lloyd Austin testifying at the um, arms, uh, Senate Arms Committee yep. meeting. Listen to what he says. Very interesting. Well, you know. mm -hmm. Certainly th those, those attacks could have uh, uh, a knock-on effect uh, for in terms of the, the global energy uh, uh, situation and and but quite frankly I think Ukraine uh, is better served in, in going after uh, uh, tactical and and uh, and operational targets that uh, that can directly influence uh, the current fight so. so it sounds to me like 
the Biden administration doesn't want gas prices to go up in an election year based on all the other actions. Yep. I think that's, I, I mentioned that at the start of the stream with that when I saw the tweet. Exactly. Thank you for the clip though, because I didn't actually see the clip. I just saw the trans, the trans. You're very clip. welcome. The bottom line is, here you go. We're not supporting the strike. And people got upset at me on my stream. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say upset, right. but they were like, okay, you know, you can't really say, and we actually got into the analysis of what Blinken said mm -hmm. about the strikes. And I told everybody, I said, listen, the U.S. is against the deep strikes. I'm, I'm telling you. And you have to listen to the nuances of the words. And that was like a week ago. Mm -hmm. Now we have the defense uh, secretary Speaking Lloyd Austin it. saying the same thing. Yeah. Guys, they are afraid of Russia. Yeah. I hate to say it as an American, yeah. but they are. They, <laughs> there's... They're afraid of the impact, too, for the election. They're afraid uh, of the out. impact. Because the reason why, too, is in 2022, we saw gas prices go up after Russia invaded, and it was an outcry. It was, I mean, I have a gas station, right. I have a gas station right down my street. I saw the prices go up. But, I mean, I, I, I knew why they were going up. But Americans that are stuck in their bias or they're stuck in a, or they're stuck in a news cycle that isn't reporting Ukraine accurately, they're being told all types of things as to why the gas prices are going up, but not the fact of the matter. So. Absolutely. Well, I mean, that's why. Yeah, so, go ahead. Just a little context before we jumped into Ukraine. I was listening to everything, um, and just wrote down those two things to kind of share before mm -hmm. we jumped into Ukraine. So I'm good to go for Ukraine now, and um, ready to share everything. Good notes. So we're gonna. We I feel can. like we're gonna like listen. As as we get closer to the election, we are gonna have to talk a little more about American politics. I feel just because of it's mm -hmm. such of an impact. Um, especially for the future of Ukraine and where what what's happening here. I mean, I I'm I'm the type of person I go to Congress personally, talk to these people, tell them, hey, let's support Ukraine, let's get this done. Which then I need to tell my viewers, etc., like what's happening with that. And that's, I feel like it's a kind of responsibility. But it's definitely it's uh, we can both agree though. I feel it's sensitive. It's a sensitive topic. Of the it's United a very States. sensitive yeah, topic. It's going to be we're going to have to walk on like a tightrope, honestly. I think with it um, to be delicate about it, and not push people away. That's what I got to work. I'm. On. Well, and one thing I try to share with people is just be patient yeah. and let things unfold because it's extremely difficult to predict anything, especially in the world in which we're living now. I will tell you this. Uh, we need to use history as a learning tool. And we also need to learn from those who have very accurately um, evaluated this war in Ukraine and been extremely accurate. Mm -hmm. The number, in my opinion, the number one world leader who has been the most accurate is the president of the Czech Republic, mm -hmm. Peter Pavel. Peter Pavel is a former Czech general, field general. He was also the supreme commander of NATO. He is now the president of Czech. And I played the it, it may even be a year ago now um at least nine months to a year ago where peter pavel came out and i played the video i did i showed it and i have referred to it 50 times for the last year peter pavel said ukraine you have until 2024 november to win the war and if we do not win the war by november 2024 all bets are off going into 2025 because right in this upcoming election cycle, not only in the United States, but also in European nations, it is going to be a major player as far as the support for Ukraine and the effort necessary not, not to hold on. See, that's the deal. Not to hold on, but to win, win. the war. There's a difference between right. trickling them to death and being the sacrificial lamb versus supplying them with the ability and the capabilities to actually win the war. And that was his reference point. Case in point, we, this was a year ago at least, yeah. nine months to a year ago. Now, in 2024, our country is in chaos. Do you feel like leaders need to just come out and say that the goal of aiding Ukraine is now to defeat Russia? They should have said it from day one. Yeah, I feel like they should have too. But I, but they don't, they don't, they don't have the, the understanding yeah. because Okay, there's two reasons they don't have the understanding. It's because they've been programmed in Soviet propaganda for 40 years and they do not even know it. Mm -hmm. 
They think they are so much smarter. I told a story today um, on the stream with Johnny, you know, <laughs> and people get mad at me for saying it, but uh, I adopted a Russian. I've been working in Russia 30 years. I have wonderful Russian friends and family, and not all Russians are orcs. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. There's some really smart people who hate the war in Ukraine who want their nation to be set free from their dictator. And that's the truth. Mm -hmm. Unless you guys have been to Russia as much as I have, you know, maybe at least ponder my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I'm telling you. Um, and it's not by accident that in general, the greatest chess players in the world, and I don't want to talk about Magnus Carlsen and, and, and all these others that are phenomenal, of course, but in general, Russian chess players have been unbelievable. Uh, our adopted daughter was grandmaster, is a grandmaster, and a freak of nature. Who is the that? point being is, yeah. uh, the but point being, they think ahead. They think ahead. And it's kind of programmed. For example, everybody in Russian schools learns to play chess. Mm -hmm. And a part of chess is you can, you think ahead mm -hmm. and you sacrifice the obvious or you sacrifice pieces to later in the game gain an advantage. And when people who only think one or two steps ahead, like the world is doing right now, and they see the sacrifice, for example, of human life, meat grinders, uh, Sanctions, finances, all these what would be assumed as sacrifices mm -hmm. in the Soviet mindset. It's just a part of the game. And they're not thinking about move two. They're thinking about move 10. Mm -hmm. And I, I told the story in, in the chat with Johnny earlier. The daughter we adopted at 15 years old. She came here. We live in Western PA. I took her to a chess tournament in, Pins in um, Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And... The, the city champion of Pittsburgh had like a, a ELO rating of like 2450, which if, if you're got, if you're people in the audience know chess, very strong. And um, she, because of her FIDE rating, FIDE, she had to play the champion of the city first game. And um, so she went in and sat at the table, very timid, 15, spoke Russian, spoke English. And the, the, the gentleman she was playing in his 40s, very arrogant. He thought he was, you know, the hot stuff, the city champion of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm a West, I'm a Pennsylvania champion. Da, 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 da. So you start the clock on the chess game and he don't, he's not even there. He shows up late. Mm. And when he comes in, he's very arrogant. She puts her little hand out to shake hands with him. And he looks at her and goes, you're my enemy. I don't shake hands with you. I'm standing over against the wall, Andrew. And she looks at me and in Russian, she asked me, what do you want me to do? I said, destroy him destroy him mm -hmm. she in the first few moves sacrificed her bishop a very strong piece mm -hmm. and the guy looks at her i'm standing right there watching because you you know as a as a like a coach which i wasn't a coach but i was i could stand there mm -hmm. and he looks at her and goes wow you are so stupid i mean an arrogant prick mm -hmm. okay you are so stupid i'm going to destroy you you think you're one fide champion from russia she looked at him and says uh, you're not going to destroy me in fact thank you for taking my bishop because in 14 moves you're done and 14 moves later andrew on the number checkmate he threw a board ran out the building the point being they're thinking ahead. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm concerned that in our landscape, world leaders aren't thinking ahead enough moves, just one or two or three, not 10. So Peter Pavel thinking way ahead, nailed it. We now see Slovakia has, Slovakia has elected a new president that is pro Kremlin. Their prime minister is pro Kremlin. Bulgaria is having unrest in regard to pro-Russian activities. The Polish border still struggles occasionally. That is Russian propaganda flowing in. Belarus border, Russian border, occupied territory, Transnester. Come on, guys. This is very easy to see and the world in chaos. So, yeah, we, we definitely can talk about 
on our Tuesdays occasionally as we get closer. Oh, yeah. You know, the pol political side of it, but it's it's very, very complex. And it we is. can't underestimate the cost of what's going on. Not at all. I agree with all that. Uh, ironically, too, I just saw a post from Kasparov today talking about his match <laughs> with uh, Kirov, What's Who did Kasparov go against? The famous Russian. He, uh, well, he played lots of players. No, he, the so five-month match he did. He did a match that lasted months, and it turned out the guy uh, said that you was got a me draw. Because I mean, I, 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 follow, I follow Kasparov on Twitter, actually. Yeah, Gary Kasparov. Yeah, because he's... Uh, let me see Why here. Is that his account not popping up right away? Yeah, I follow Gary on Twitter. Yeah, he, he played Karpov. Yeah, that's Karp Karpov, that's the guy you played. Yeah, Karpov. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find the tweet here. If I can pull it up for a second. He tweeted, he, he, someone had tweeted about his match he had. Yes. And, and he had made a comment about it. No, I can't find it. Actually, I guess I should have saved it. Whatever, though. Whatever, though. But yeah. Good uh, and moral of the story: play chess, chat. Okay, it'll help you learn strategy. Yeah. And well, it, all, it, all, yeah, it's, all called long, it's called the longest game, and it's it's very. Now that you remind me, I looked it up real quick. I remember it's very famous. Um, yeah, I just got a pop up from Twitter really quick. X is updating communities to increase relevancy and safety while providing you greater moderator control. A not safe for work filter is now applied by default and can be controlled by your. Because the porn is just getting out of control on Twitter. It's just like you'd be scrolling and then it's just porn right there for you. Because there's no content moderation on this thing. Anyways, all right, get the map of Ukraine up. Let me get um, Greg on the screen so we can go through our map update. Give me one second, y'all. There he is. Okay, now let me, mm -hmm. let me get you sized up quick so you can get put right onto the map with me. <clears throat> you guys could chat. Put your comments in the comment section. What city, what state, where in the world are you tuned in from? Let's go through a map breakdown and update. Perfect. All right. You're nice and... There you go. Eh, yeah, your, your camera's a little off, but it's fine. Stick right oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to get you... In. There you go. Perfect. All right. So, then I can share the map with you here so you can see what I'm doing on the screen. We're going, we're going high-tech technologies, you guys. All right. Hey, we're high rednecks we can even get dubs in warzone and duos yeah, that's the other thing go. too hey chat listen we played warzone the other day too by the way I me mean, oh whoops i closed you out by accident but we played warzone you guys together on my gaming channel if you missed it but here it is really really fast after my new streams <laughs> i do go to my gaming channel and we play but greg and i we had like a six hour oh well, we played for five hours and i played like a we like did a, i played like an extra hour um both with some of my subscribers but we ended up getting a win and mm. everything we had a really good time we did yeah it was it was a lot of fun it was a lot of fun all right so all right let's all right. get through the map let's update let's go through the map update um first area okay, so if you just zoom out okay. and we can x off right now um i like starting at chernigiv and sumi okay no change the rg no changes the only the on, yep the only thing i will say is in regard to chernigiv right there um that is where north of that president Zelensky was and they were showing and I don't, I don't mean this with a negative connotation but they were showing off or letting the world see the new fortifications that have been built um and a very high level so that is the region where Zelensky was if you've seen those videos a few days ago mm -hmm. he was up north of chernigiv so chernigiv and sumi the same you, your issues there the drg um and of course if you think about belarus belarus or belarus they've been talking about rattling their sabers with mobilization and all of this don't worry about that guys mm -hmm. Uh, more importantly than what their military could do is the access that they give russia that's the most important thing um, not really. Their military is, is no no problem. Their access that they give Russia, their resources, their stockpiles, those are the things that we have to pay attention to. Um, if we move over, over to Kharkiv, Kharkiv, guys, is... Um, Kharkiv is being bombed nonstop. 1.3 million people um, are there, were there. A couple of things I will say about Kharkiv over the last five or six days, there were viral uh, telegram and Twitter videos that showed this long line of vehicles. And it said, everybody's fleeing Kharkiv due to the shelling. Guys, that was 
propaganda coming from Russia. There was not a traffic jam. There were not people fleeing Kharkiv. None of that was true. Not even 1%. That was all propaganda. What I can tell you, though, roughly half a million people are without power in that city on a rotating basis. And I can tell you that the number now is they've lost housing ability for 150,000 people. So the mayor actually came out and said, okay, we have 150,000 homeless people. So that doesn't mean there's 150,000 homeless people on the streets. Mm -hmm. There's not. Um, They go to live with families or they have to leave. Um, But they've lost housing now for 150,000 people due to the damage to the, you know, 9, 14, 16, five story apartment buildings that are being hit relentlessly. Also, this is the city where the video went viral of the fireman kneeling down and he was being consoled. Okay. We know that guy, his name um, is Volva Vladimir. It was his father that was killed and these are the two guys, Volva and his father, who was killed, um, that are also auto, they're also auto mechanics. And um, they actually do all the servicing for Pete's vehicles for Project Constantine. So a very, very deep bond and relationship there. Um, in fact, when he was struck and killed... Um, it was four in the morning and Pete called me immediately and says, man, um, I, I'm distraught right now. Just talk to me, say hello to me, do anything, speak English to me. I'm all I'm hearing is Ukrainian now. And I need to hear, I need to hear English and you're my buddy. Um, we just lost him. And there was a lot of concern on the inside of project Constantine with the admins and, and they're all a family. They're wonderful people because they had requested body armor Mm -hmm. and we had been unable to get it to them yet because I was going to help them with that. Um, And, and they were distraught. The, the admins and the the administrators and the media people that helped project Constantine. And they were all on a, on a private group together and they messaged and like next to peers or whatever. And I, I said, guys, nothing a body armor would not have saved that man nothing he he was pulverized Mm -hmm. um and then pete messaged back into the group and says guys yeah don't a concrete block would not have saved him He, he it was not possible it struck right beside him um so i hate to say this it did give them a little consolation knowing that he didn't die from a bullet wound and didn't have body armor on, but it was it was unstoppable. So that's that's what's happening in Kharkiv, and that viral video is from a double tap in Kharkiv. And what is a double um, tap? What, we, what is a double tap? Can you explain that really quick in case someone doesn't know that? That's what's yes, I, I do because they have increased um, their use of double taps. So a double tap is Russia will strike a target. And that target can be anything. It can be a military target. It can be a non-military target. It can be a residential building. It can be a hospital. It can be a, a auto dealership. It can be anything. Okay. And of course, once something is hit, there are massive fires. If you go back about a month ago, I was live at the Kharkiv strike. Mm-hmm. It was actually extremely dangerous because I was right there. And we were we were expecting a double tap, and we were staying just away from the rescuers. I hate to say this, but just in case there was a double tap, mm-hmm. so we could have got right to where they were at with my access card. Um, but we chose to kind of stay over here, unfortunately, because we were we were concerned that there would be a double tap. So typically, what Russia is doing once they strike, mm-hmm. they then are waiting for. 15, 20, 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and they know the maximum number of rescue personnel are there. And then they hit it again to kill them. Now, you may be asking out there, well, isn't that illegal? It was not only illegal, 
forget legality. There is no legality in this war when it comes to Russia. There are no rules of war when it comes to Russia. It's inhumane. It's immoral. It's evil. And you may ask, okay, well, how are they getting, how do, how do they know that? Like, how do they know that uh, the maximum number of firemen are there and police and, and rescue squads and all of that? How do they know? Most of the time, they know because of this. Smartphone. And the collaborator. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a hundred firemen here. Thank you. That's it. It's not typically a drone flying overhead. It's typically collaborators passing the information. Because if you strike a building in Kharkiv, Kharkiv, guys, is a massive city. You can't drive across yeah, Kharkiv. It's huge. If there's traffic, you're an hour getting across Kharkiv. So they're getting the inside information. It's 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 really tough. So that's the story on Kharkiv. Now, if you move south towards Kupiansk, um, you will get the dude. What is that plugin you're using again? Draw, on, draw, draw. Thank you, thank you. On Chrome, right? Yep. Okay. This is the best place right now for Ukrainian defensive lines. And I know you look up at that map and you say, well, I see some gold up there. Yes, you do. This is the best place right now that Ukraine has the lines stabilized. It's a strategic Once city, too. Get, Very strategic. It is extremely strategic. Mm-hmm. Um, so what we look at now is cities that can be accessed that give Russia or Ukraine access to function. Why is this city so important? This city is important because it gives Ukraine coverage to bring in supply. A lot of the access roads coming into Kupiansk are coming through forest, and there is a lot of cover. I've been all up in this area, and it, 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 you, you have better coverage from drones that would be flying overhead just due to the trees. I understand thermal and all that jazz, but just in general, right. it's not wide open fields. You have some natural cover, very forested area. Um, and this city allows for a lot of not only uh, a stabilization and a place for even rest from the guys that are not so far away from their frontline positions where they can rotate to get their rest every couple of days, three days, five days. Um, but it also allows access for Ukraine to bring supply in. Of course, they need 100% more supply, but Kupiansk is stable to the right in the red. Russia does have a lot of munitions there and Russia does have a lot of soldiers there. However, recently, Within the last week, they have been rotating soldiers out of this area. Instead of trying to push in and and work on Kupiansk more, they have increased their efforts down south, specifically in Chasivyar. They're seeing it too. And yes, and down towards Krasnogorivka. Um, So all of that is good. So this entire line here is stable and then i i um i was watching a little bit of you last i think it was last night yeah. when you were talking about the number of rivers mm-hmm. and lakes and ponds for yeah like okay it's not it's not easy to move in this region it's hilly it's foresty multiple and rivers there are multiple it's, rivers it's just yeah. full, so full it is it, and in many places it's extremely Swampy. Because it's like in here, in here, you got to get through the forest, but then you have to navigate the rivers in here in the forest, and then mm-hmm. there's village. It's and that's why the Russians haven't been able to push farther than where they've been at for the last year and a half uh, in this section. Yes, and um, it, it's the easiest place for uh, Ukraine to defend mm-hmm. is the forested areas versus the open areas, and it's logical, guys, because they can get supply there better. They can uh, rescue their wounded better because mm-hmm. they had the protection minimally of the forest. In fact, the video that you show on your Ukraine intro, when the vehicle that Mercado Media partnered with, um, and you see Pete kneeling by that vehicle and it says Mercado Media on it, he was at that time right there in that forest. That is where that video was. In mm-hmm. fact,
it's this right here. It's Crimina. And um, this patch right here I was using earlier. I can put it back on my microphone. Everybody likes to put the mm -hmm. patch of the day on. And I've uh, been doing that quite a bit. Uh, but the Crimina, this patch right here, there's only 10 in the world. Only 10. They made 10. And this was the commander's patches for the guys in Crimina Forest. And Pete was given two because of how many people he was rescuing a year ago in the war. And he wears it right here, Crimina. Mm -hmm. And when we became very, very close, as we are, he reached into his pocket and he says, Greg, I was saving this for the right person. And he gave it to me. He says there are only 10 in the world. And this was worn by a hero in the battles in the Crimina Forest. So wow. very special treasure, treasure for me. Um, and uh, so we'll leave that right there. So that's that area. You come down to Siversk, which is what you're looking at now, on the northern side of Siversk. Uh, Russia continuing their pressure, but not really an assault. Um, the northern side, it, that's a swamp. Yeah, look at that. Look, you right can see there. it. Look at how Dude, many water is a, all in here. Look at all this. It's a horrible swamp. Um, so, yes. So the protection Ukraine has there is actually geography. Mm hmm um, so what Russia will try to do is push north of that, and but then you're dealing with a huge forested area. So mm -hmm. this area is basically stable as well. Um, Russia's best push to try to get into Seversk, which is the blue rectangle, is actually from the south, um, where you see some of the gold push there. Yep. It's hilly, but it's much drier. It's more open, um, which is much more dangerous for both sides because both sides can just smash, e smash each other. Mm -hmm. So this, this line's going to hold uh, pretty much right now. There's not a lot of assault on that area. Yep. Um, now, you come down, now we get into trouble. Yep. And we've been talking about this for weeks now. You, I mean, you, were, had, you were still in Ukraine when you were talking about Ivanevsky, and you said Ivanevsky was mm -hmm. already gone. Bodanivka is gone, but it's, that's not reflected yet. This village here, mm -hmm. when you were there like a week or two ago, I mean, it just wasn't reflected yet, but it's it's slowly reflecting on the map well, here. Well, that village, so There's, just so you know, yep. that's Chasivyar. This is this is part of Chasivyar here? Absolutely. Oh, that's okay. eastern. So that's Chasivyar East. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Okay. And then you have the, the green belt with the mm -hmm. canal. Yep. And then you have Chasivyar Center. Yep. in Chasivyar West. So R Russia is already in. I can tell you right now, they're in on the first two streets of Chasivyar there. They're a little bit further than that, actually. Um, and that section right there is destroyed. In fact, okay, let's see how high tech we can get here. I show, maybe, we need to show this right here. I'm okay. going to show you guys. So you going to have some fun? Mm-hmm. Okay, take me to uh, Google Maps okay. and go to satellite view and go to that exact spot while I pull up a video file. Okay, okay there's Shasivyar on the screen. I, I thought I did not know that this was also part of Shasivyar. I always thought this was a satellite yes. village over here. No, that's eastern Shasivyar. And then that little teeny green belt there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do you see that right there? Chasivyarsky. Yeah. Look at the in the in the Ukrainian mm -hmm. uh, where your red dot is. Chasivyarsky. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Um. So let me. Sh so I'm going to show you one thing here, and I'm pulling up some video. Uh, okay. I'm going to pull that down, and I think I'm going to share this now. We're going to, uh, for the guys in here that are a part of my channel as well, you've seen this, mm -hmm. but I'm going to show this to you guys. I can, I can share my screen on that yep. in a second, but go, go back to the, to the Google first. Okay. And go back into the East Chasif Yar. Okay. And show you something. Okay. Did you want me to stay um, on, this, I, on the Google Maps one, right? The satellite? I can't see it with you right now. Okay, um, you should be able to now. I, I just reshared it to you. I unshared it because just in case you were gonna share that video, but you should be. Okay. To. No, yeah. I still see you. Okay, you just see me. You don't. It's not sharing to you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let me try again. Okay. 
And Actually, I, I, look. There we go. I, I just sent it again. You see it? No, I just see you. But that's okay. That's okay. okay. Um, so zoom in to Chasivyar okay. East. Okay. And you will see what's called the Boriso Hram. It's on the center of that eastern portion at the bottom. Right here. And you see, if you can get to the right angle, you'll see a couple of shadowed gold domes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if you look to the left of that, I don't know which angle you're looking because I'm not seeing real time, but if you look to the left of that, you'll see one apartment building standing out like it takes a left turn looking back toward Chasivyar Central. Like it's to the left of the Boral Haram? Yeah, so you're at the bottom, you see the Haram there. Yep, yep. Actually, you know what? Let's do it this way. Let's do it this way. I think you might be able to. I won't, yeah, uh, yeah I, let me share it. I want people yeah, yeah. to see this. This is, this is very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, I, I want to be able to show. So I'm going to share this screen. I'm going to share this one. All right. You tell me when we're good. We're good to go. Okay. So uh, I'll put on the layers here, and we're going to go right into uh, Chasivyar. Let me pull back. We're no, getting I'm fancy, chats. Hot dogs Dude, do go with are. coffee. They do go with coffee. We're high-tech rednecks. All right. Yep. So here we go, guys. This is right here. Uh, boom. This is all Chasivyar. That's all Chasivyar. Mm -hmm. And this is the central green belt right here in between the two red lines. I want you to remember that. I'm going to show you guys a video in a moment. And the video is from Russia from the 98th. And the video, you're, the way you'll be looking is actually looking this way. Okay. Okay. And you will see this green belt. You will see uh, Chasivyar in the distance. And then you will see this way. It goes uphill. And that would be Konstantinivka on the top of the hill. You're going to see all of that. Um, but what I want to show you specifically is this. So right here, you see these two golden domes mm -hmm. right there. And this is Baruso Glibsky Kram. It's a temple. Barisi Glibsky Kram. It's a church, Orthodox church. Gold with a point. Gold with a point. And the white pad. Okay. Now if I just remember that, let me do this and do this, do this. Do that, and let me go out. Now, you're going to be looking uh, this direction, okay. and you're going to see the temple here, and you look past the temple, and it's going to be all grassland here, and you're going to see one building sitting out here by itself. Okay. This That's is cool. how I'm, prov I'm proving to you the video you're looking at is this, this. area all here. One okay. million percent, and guys, this is destroyed gone uninhabitable in fact this section here is leveled to the ground gone so that sets that up now if i do this do you see the video now i i just did the same am i still sharing that screen or yeah it's, it's still on the map screen okay so let me do this and let me share this and i'll share that you tell me when it's time to go all right it's on all right, guys, you see the golden temple right there? The golden yep. uh, right on the front, bottom left of the screen. Yep. Do you see the building on the left I showed you? Yep. You see the, the, the green belt behind it? Yes. All right, here we go. So just look at the destruction right there. I'll pause it. Church destroyed. Mm -hmm. Every building uninhabitable. The building I used to mark on the left, plus the green belt behind. Mm -hmm. One million percent. This, I mean, I know it is, but one million percent for those that wouldn't know. Um, and it's going to zoom out in a minute. It's going to show their logo. They've got a gloat. 
You can see the buildings burning right in the middle. This is uninhabitable. Now they're going to put their logo up and gloat. Sviriskaya, the 98th. Right now, look at this angle. That shows the whole look on your yep. look. Yep, look on your right behind their logo, the 98th. Every home leveled. Look, I mean, guys, just just look in the the bottom half of the screen, the foreground. Mm -hmm. Everything is destroyed. Then you see the green belt. Then you see central western Chasivyar, and you see the the terrain go uphill, and that goes up towards Konstantinivka. Play it more. You can even see the smoke in the center of the city too. You can see artillery. Oh, absolutely! Hitting. They're already hitting it. Yep. Yeah, look in the center. Exactly. Good call. Good call. I talk to people all the time that are actually in that city. And I'm telling you right now, there, you can see the explosion. Yep. I'll back it up. Look in the center of the screen. Center left. Look right behind the church steeples. Boom. Cluster munition. Look at that. Look at the tops of these buildings, guys. Look right there. Just Gone. missing. Gone. Gone. It looks like Bakhmut when Russians were it, advancing through Bakhmut. It's, it is going to be the same. It's going to be leveled. Mm -hmm. All of that will be leveled. Yeah, a lot of and that looks is destroyed what too, to be honest. A lot oh, of they're that... already, it's already tore. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's Chassiv Yar. That is Chassiv Yar. So I'm back to you now, I think. Should be. I'm All right. Get you back on so screen. hopefully that helps people understand a little better. Um, it's crazy. It is. And we've been talking about it now for a couple of weeks when the Russians had started their new advancement through Avivka, but it also reflected around Bakhmut, around through, well, they're through Ivanevsky now, but it, they hadn't originally, but they had started to, but that continues. Mm -hmm. And you can see even, uh, as you can see, Shasiv Yar just destroyed there with that video. Let me get you yeah. back on the screen again. Here we go. No so problem. that is the situation there then. So what we're looking at mm -hmm. from that video, um, just to reiterate, because I'll draw on this map, is this is all destroyed, right? When we saw from Greg's video, the church was like down here, for example. And then there was the apartments that we're looking at. And then this space um, that was to the west, that, that green, uh, what'd you, what's this called? That corridor? That, green belt. The green belt between the two. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, and it's typical. And so this city is exactly the same as Bakhmut, just mm -hmm. a tenth of the size. Um, but Bakhmut as well had the, the little river running through about a third of it. And then you had, you had Bakhmut on the right, on the east, and you had central Bakhmut and western Bakhmut. The same thing there for Chasif Yard, just a smaller scale. And what I showed you was east of the green belt and east of the river or the canal. And you guys saw it for yourself. It's leveled. And then you're seeing already. That, yeah, there's central Chastiv oh, Yard. Listen, hit, guys, yeah. if you were to, even if you were to, Western Chastiv Yard is demolished. Eastern Konstantinivka is demolished. Mm -hmm. So just think about, I mean, all of Chastiv Yard is demolished, but what you're seeing there is what, what will happen. It will just be swallowed up meter by meter by meter. Um, so that's the latest on Chastiv Yard. Uh, going down the map from there south, the next place we need to pay attention to is two, two places um, of big concern. I mean, not really big concern, but I, I don't mean that negatively. I mean, it's we knew this was coming, but yeah. west of Avdivka, um, the maps will show you Semenivka still holding on, but it's it's just it's over. Uh, yeah, Russia has established the northern point at the headwaters of the river, um, and they'll be able now to push on down and take Semenivka, um, so that stretch there. But below Semenivka on your map there, going towards Yasna Borodivka, mm -hmm. um, you will see a big heavy red. And I know you're using ISW map, right? Yep. Okay. Um, Russia has done a pretty significant push on this area here. Um, also down below that um, in Pervo, in Pervomysk. Yeah, Pervo, um, yep. Yes, they, they really, 
it's gone yep. and uh, this is this is a troubled area why is that area so troubled um because that gives them northern ability to shell Krasnogorivka. Which, which they are is, advancing in the southern part of the city. Dude, and this city yes, is they, massive in this area. I mean, it's not as big as Donetsk, but in this region, in contrast to the other villages, it's a pretty sizable city, correct? Yes, this is um, 16,000 pre-war, so this is bigger than Chasivyar. Um but what's important about this city is it is basically the gateway to Karakova. Mm. So if you look to the left, yep. Karakova, right. Karakova on the, on the lake there. Yep. I've been to Karakova. It's gotta be a beautiful city, huh? On that lake. It's very, well, it was, right. it's destroyed. Pre-war, now. pre-war. It's destroyed. Right. Yeah, pre-war. Um, but it's an extremely key city logistically speaking for ukraine i'll have to leave it at that um because I, I i don't want to get 10 emails in the morning when i woke up when i wake up saying okay thank you for the update but watch your opsec yep. um karakova is vitally important for ukraine for supply routes i will tell you why generally you see the h15 coming in behind it yep. And there's cover there in those river basins and some villages where Ukraine can work through to get supplies in. And that's their supply line versus the supply line that Russia has coming through the massive city of Donetsk. Um, no, basically you talking, I'm just gonna show how it connects. There's Krakowa, yeah. look at Zaporizhia. There's a, there's a highway that goes right to it from Zaporizhia. Yes, basically, yeah, that's the road that yep. connects Donetsk to Zaporizhia. That's the road we run all the time, H-15. So the, the other thing is, to be quite honest, if I'm explaining this the right way, when you look at the city of Donetsk, and if you will go over on the map to Donetsk and kind of pull back just a touch, you'll see Makivka up to the northeast. Um, and I'm doing this in my head because I, I'm, I'm still seeing you, but we can make it, no problem. Okay. Um, Makivka. That's where Rick the Ukrainian's from, and that's not private information. That's right. public. He says it right in his descriptions. That's why am I struggling with Makivka? To, why am I struggling with it? Where is it? I'm struggling. Uh, you see Donetsk. Yep. And then zoom out a little bit. Let me go to YouTube. I'm, I'm behind you. So oh, it's, Makivka is just to the east of Donetsk. Okay. Yeah, northeast. There yep. you go. Okay. Right there. I got Makivka. it. Yep. You've got it. Okay, so that's that's where Rick is from. Um, but but let me tell you this, guys. You don't know you've left Donetsk, okay? Okay. It's just a suburb. It's like Minneapolis, St. Paul. Right. It's a huge place. Um, and then if you're looking at the map and you see to the left of Donetsk, like Avdivka mm -hmm. to the north of Donetsk and Yasnuvata, yep. which is to the right of Avdivka, and then to the left down, we've been talking about Krasnogorivka mm -hmm. and the, all these, you really do not know you've left Donetsk until you get to Karakova. I see. So does that make sense right. for you guys? It's like suburbs. So when you're talking about Donetsk and Avdivka, it's suburbs. Mm -hmm. It's connected. When you're talking about Karakova, I mean, Krasnogorivka, if you look really closely there, Krasnogorivka goes right into Donetsk. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, it's, it's like literally right there. The yeah. Oh, absolutely. You've never left the city. Um, so that's why these are vitally important. But if Krasnogorivka goes and below that is Marinka yep. and it push, which is already gone. And you see, if you zoom in below that, you see the two lakes coming out of Marinka yep. and the next town is Girgivka. Georgie is the name of that town. I'll translate it for you. Girgivka, Georgie town. Um, if Krasnogorivka goes and they start pushing for Karakova. It's it's going to be not really a good situation. So Ukraine needs supply yesterday to hold this at bay. Guys, what holds this at bay is the ability to put artillery on those lines. Mm -hmm. And they do not have that artillery to do that. Um, we the, the drone war is a different type of war. It's nonstop. Uh, Pete will describe it. He was supposed to be with me live Monday, but he got rotated out to his zero position. Yep. And they, he put a little message up and said, I'm sorry. And it was just wonderful. He like, he's apologizing. I'm sorry. I've got to go to the zero line. And people were going, uh, don't apologize. And 
we love you and yeah right i know like, yeah he's don't so apologize. nice he's so nice i know yeah. i'm sorry i have to go yeah, fight I'm the so war sorry. that you talk I've got, about i've got yeah i've got to go do my i gotta go to the zero line i'm sorry yeah um but he's he's okay today um but uh it, it, it's the drone warfare is a different type of warfare um that's non-stop for both sides regardless but when we're talking about holding these lines ukraine needs artillery and they need the ability to stop the glide bombs that's it and we, we do not have that um i know you said probably over the as we go through this year, we'll have to talk about politics a little bit more, and that'll be that'll be just fine. You know, you remember over the last week or so, um, Speaker Johnson. You know, we're back on the ninth, and we will first thing be discussing Ukrainian aid. Yeah, that go. Yeah, how's that working out for you today? Yeah, nothing, it's over. Nothing. We're now looking at the tenth. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And what actually happened on the ninth? Lord Cameron went and saw Donald Trump, and got told a story he didn't like. I'm telling you, mm -hmm. and uh, went on up and talked to Blinken. So that's the reality of what happened on the ninth. Instead of Ukrainian aid being uh, discussed, what else happened on the ninth? Lloyd Austin sitting at the hearing, going, "Well, you know, we really don't support you striking deep into Russia. Yeah. We don't support that." Okay, so instead of it even being a positive day yeah. for American aid and American motivation even saying hey we're discussing it we're going to get this done in the next couple of days just hang on um none of that nope. we got quite the opposite we've got we've got trump doing his deal with cameron and we got boyd austin saying mm, not really sure about those long-range strikes so um, not the strongest not the messaging best. yeah not the strongest from not the, United the best States. today but we'll wait and see Hopefully, what happens tomorrow yeah, tomorrow is a new day <laughs> so all in all this is the section we're seeing uh, these Russian advancements again, which is to the uh, west of Avdivka through Pervo or Pervmiatske, um, Pervomysk, Pervomysk, yeah, mm -hmm. Pervomysk, which that looks like is going to is captured or Russia occupies that now, and they're moving towards um, Nitalova, Nital Nitalova, and then mm -hmm. also here in the city of Krasnorivka, the Russians have established. A foothold within that city. We got a little bit of a Ukrainian pushback, which you talked about, and that's why I, I'm going to tune into you and Jonathan. You guys were just mm -hmm. talking about this, and like I had seen yes. that there was a pushback, but you can see that the Russians are still within yeah, the they've, city. They've got they've got a couple streets there, yeah, um, under their control. Um, and and I'll teach you something uh, that'll help you also. So when you see Krasnogorivka, so whenever you see the H. And you're naming these towns. Mm -hmm. Make the H a G sound. Okay. Krasnogorivka. Okay. And the Ukrainians will know that dude's a stud. <laughs> okay. He knows how to pronounce it. Krasnogorivka. Okay. Uh, it, it's really uh, it's goofy on that Ukrainian language with that H letter. So mm -hmm. Krasnogorivka. That's why if you look down below that, and it it looks like it's spelled. H E O R mm -hmm. Hifka, and I pronounced it Girgifka. I see Georgie Village. Gear, Gir, yeah. So just whenever you see an H, drop a G sound. All right. Also, we see Russian advancements in Novo Mikhailivka, which they have been yes. trying to advance. This is south of Donetsk, and they're able to, looks like a city block and a half or a couple city blocks. This continues. The Ukrainians have been holding a defensive in the city but it's slowly going under russian control they have no supply yeah um and and that's a decent size uh little village there um it, it, it's it's decent five six thousand people pre-war um of course nowhere near that now it's just sad Decent to see. Look. It's just sad to see because, like, I mean, you just touched on it. I mean, we know why. You know the exact reasons why this is happening with the lack of mm -hmm. aid, and then Ukraine solved the internal problem of getting more or lowering their um, recruitment age to twenty-five. That's something that they had to do. They got that done, but we're not aiding Ukraine how we should be, and we're seeing the results of that. You you want to see something cool? If you if you stay there, we'll just have a little fun now for a second. If you look at Nova Mikhail. Mikhailivka mm -hmm. and kind of zoom in 
far enough where that's on the bottom right of your screen, and then you kind of look up the river at all the village names. Paraskovilka, Konstantinivka, mm -hmm. Antonivka, Kantarunka, Ilinka, Yelzavika, Romanovka. Mm -hmm. You see all that? Yep. Okay, yep. so here, here's something really cool, guys. All of those village names along those towns are named after people. Wow. So, yes. Okay, so the first village there is Paraskovivka. It's named after Paras. The next one is Kostiantonivka. It's named after the, the name Kostia. Okay. The next one is Antonivka, Anton. Then you have Katarinivka, named after Katia or Kathy. Then you have Ilyanika, Ilyanka, which is named after Ilya. Then you have Yezlavativka, which is named after Yezlavs. Then you have Romanivka, which is named after Roman. And then you have Ganivka, which is named after somebody named Gani. So most likely back in history, these were like family members that established these farming villages. Mm -hmm. And most likely my guess is they named them after whoever founded the little, these are just little tiny little farming villages, basically families and, you know, uh, very small, but they were originally named after somebody's name. So that's what all those names are. Persons what? names. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. You know, that was my favorite part when I was in Kiev. Um, was going to the museums and learning the history because there's so many museums in Ukraine. They have museums for museums and learning the history about Ukraine and knowing how old it is and how original that Ukraine was with many things, with farming, their mm -hmm. existence over Russia. Everything was first in Ukraine for many different facets of life. And it's just really, really cool to learn when you actually go there and you get the history. I'm looking at some of your chat now. Andrew Gordon says, damn, what did I, I don't use that word, but oh, I got the curse jar. I, yeah, on our gaming the other night, they were going, man, do a fundraiser, Andrew. You're playing, you're playing clean because the pastor's in here. Uh, it's at, uh, uh what did what did i join or something i'm 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 learning something it was really cool and uh you just a lot of good nice comments in there so i, I lost well, it, now. Glad it to was hear. up there so you guys have yeah, any questions so, for greg while he's here thank you we just went through a map the map rundown the front line update there's no changes in zaporizhia in here song the lines no the, the only ch and robotny is holding on yeah that's holding no no move as well um, we're really only seeing big changes in Donetsk from Bakhmut down below Donetsk city itself. That's where yeah. We're so basically below Siversk, mm -hmm. um, the Southern side of Siversk all the way down to, um, Nova Mikhailovka. that line. So basically that line before it turns, if you're looking at the map straight to the left, mm -hmm. so the lower eastern front versus the southern front exactly when are you how's the fundraiser going for the armored vehicles what's this, what's the status on that what's the latest okay so um tomorrow night dr gertis will be on with me at five o'clock eastern and we will give the update which which day but tomorrow night, tomorrow night. five o'clock eastern we will give the official update um but I will tell you this right now. There's going to be a significant jump. Right now, we're at $214,000 raised of the 260. Mm -hmm. Additionally, we also today received and approved the contract for the purchase. And hopefully tomorrow we will do the export contract because you have to have the export licenses because we're using a third party company yeah. um, to eliminate the headaches. And this is, they've done it nonstop during the war that takes out the Polish border problem that takes out all of that mess. Um, Cause they will be licensed to get the vehicles in. We've already done all the documentation to go from our nonprofit in the U S purchase it out of the UK, get them into our nonprofit in Ukraine from there um this is now four uh, armored snatches and not just getting the vehicles there we then will trick them out meaning run flat tires double-sided winches uh front and back the latest anti-drone and drone jammers and the best night vision for ukraine we're, we're outfitting that inside ukraine because 
especially for the drone jammers, they have the best technology there. Mm -hmm. No joke, because they're dealing with it every two weeks changing. Um, so that will all happen there. I am a firm, I'm, I'm feeling very confident that in the next two weeks, we're going to have, we're going to be at the 260. But I can tell you, come tomorrow night, there's going to be a significant jump from 214 up. Um, so I'll have to tune in. Is it going to be on your YouTube channel or Professor Gertis? Yeah, it'll be on mine. Gertis, okay. it'll be on both. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll push it from my software to his. I'm trying to get Dr. Gertis into the 21st century with streaming, um, but he, he's getting there. But I'll yeah. push his stream for him. Um, yeah, it's, it's exciting, guys. Uh, really, it, it's the number one request. I will tell you why, and that is because Ukrainian heroes are having to die on the battlefield when they shouldn't have to, and it's because they cannot get to them. The medics and the rescue units cannot get to them because it's too dangerous. They do not have armored medevac vehicles. So we will be supplying four um, to different units. And you guys here, thank you. If you want to help with that at all, you can just go to my channel and the link's right there. We are a nonprofit here in the U.S. And you can uh, you just click gregterry.org front slash donate and it goes to our nonprofit connection with PayPal or our nonprofit uh, connection for direct donation. We have zero admin fees. It's not paying any staff. It's not. It's zero. Every penny goes to Ukraine, and it goes to the projects. And and we 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 deliver what we promise, uh, just like NAFO does. And I know that's a big push here at Mercado Media as well. And it's it, it, incredible what NAFO does. So these are good good places to um, try and try and help Ukraine and see your investment actually there. Absolutely. Do you have any final thoughts today, Greg? Uh, all the news, anything you want to leave? I the have with? my final thoughts are thank you all. Um, thank you all. Uh, tonight, please remember the cranky guys. Uh, we work directly with the cranky guys. Uh, this patch here was in cranky in the battle and um, was given to me as a gift. Um, these are the guys we help. And I told Johnny tonight on the stream, um, I had taken Johnny to the, uh, location where the cranky guys rotate from. I took them to the cranky guys home mm -hmm. and, um, I had to tell Johnny that the video that kind of went viral when it was showing the Russians basically murdering, assassinating three of the cranky heroes. Actually, four were killed, but three were assassinated. Um, and it went viral in the videos. Those were people that he had met, and I knew. So last night on the stream, it, it kind of grabbed me a little bit. So I would say this for close out my Taco Tuesday or uh, time with Andrew here is be thankful for what you have. Be thankful for your home, your health. Uh, and by the way, I did see the picture on Twitter of your kidney stones. When you pass them, you pass professional ones, I see. <laughs> Dude, oh, yeah. they, were, they were boulders. Uh, I've been down. I've been, I've been trying to Bro. I've been trying to power mm. through streams even with some passing. You did amazing so. to get those suckers out. Yeah. Um, mm, I, I can't even think about it. <laughs> it's, but, it's, it hurts. <laughs> Be thankful, guys, for what you have. You're not sitting in a in a bunker tonight. You're not sitting in a trench. You're not trying to sleep with your body wet and rats running across. Um, you're not being shelled. You're not having to listen to drones go nonstop over your head. You're not going to hear an air alarm go off at 2 o'clock in the morning and wake you and your family up and disrupt your entire life. You're not going to be standing in line at the bank tomorrow at 1030 a.m. trying to take care of your, your personal business, make a deposit, pay a bill, and the air alarm goes off and the bank closes and you have to run out and then you can't do your business. You're living a normal life. 
So here we're doing our best to help the best we can. That is to tell the truth, to try to bring understanding, not only to the war situation in Ukraine, but all the other things that Andrew covers as well, the political situation, and, and break it down, have a place of discussion. And I think more importantly, having a place of camaraderie and people um, that do not have to agree on everything specifically. But we have like mindedness when it comes to our goal. And that's the groups that are successful. So be thankful for what you have tonight. That's that's how I close out. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Greg, from the Greg You're Terry welcome, Experience man. YouTube channel. Look forward to and I appreciate oh, No, I, I appreciate uh you, Andrew. My channel's really been growing. I am almost at ten thousand subscribers. And uh when I started streaming, I had two people watching and nobody knew what I was doing in Ukraine and we were faithful and now it's growing. And um, so think, I know a lot of your folks have come over. They are all always in my live streams at five and they say, Hey, Merck family here, Mercado media family here, Mercado media traveler here. And I like to give them shout outs and all of that stuff. And, um, but thank you. Thank you to the travelers. Thank you guys for all that you do. Um, we're getting there and we just keep pushing together and we will accomplish our goal. So you guys be blessed. And Andrew, you know where I'm heading right now? I'm getting ready to play with us, uh, Guzman and my daughter. Yeah, you're getting ready to fire up the war zone, huh? I'm dropping in bio, baby. Drop in. All right, Greg. Thank you so much for uh, you taking your time today. Thank Have a good brother. one, Greg. There we go. There's the oh, and by the way, there was one more thing I wanted to say. Okay. I'm watching your stream. Mm-hmm. I watch you quite regularly. I put it over here on this monitor. And uh, two things I want to say. Mm -hmm. uh, message me tomorrow sometime, and I'll give you a breakdown on the software options, especially mm -hmm. with Restream and what Johnny used, what I use. Okay. I, secondly, you played that song the other night. The encrypting song? Yes. All I, all I, I, I don't get into any of that stuff. Right. I just let my work stand for itself, and I, I, I support you 100% in your uh, battle for truth and get rid of the trash that's out there. Mm -hmm. I completely support. In fact, I'm, I'm just ready to get some of my Ukrainian hacker buddies from the Ukrainian military to <clears throat> take a few places down. Um, <clears throat> all things are possible. Um, but that song... I'm sitting here jamming and I'm going, dude, somebody in the Travelers is extremely talented. And not only that, they sing like a freaking angel. They, and then they, you get to the end and you pop my bubble. Well, that was actually AI. And I said, what? It's a jam. Dude, that's scary. It was. It's scary, but man, what a jam that was. So uh, you can play that anytime. Oh, we definitely. I think we'll, we'll sign out to that one today. <laughs> But, yeah. th but thank you, Greg. Oh, then I'll be watching. Thank you, man. We'll holler at you later. I'll see you in Warzone sometime. Absolutely. See buddy. you next Tuesday. See All you, buddy. Right. Take later. care. All right. Greg Terry from the Greg Terry Experience YouTube channel. That is a classic song. I will say so. What are they what are they about? What are they doing right now? Should be live. We need to do a super chat watch session again. Russia top gun school hit. Air Force hurt. Um <laughs> what? Um, where is that? Where do they, where do they find this news? You guys, Russia's air force pilot training hub hit by drones and explosive video. The uh, Russian aviation training center for pilot training in Borga Zolbetsk is in the Voron's region came under attack by UAVs Monday night. Multiple videos, uh, including night vision, CCTV footage, appear to show a massive explosion hit in the area where Aviation Training Center is located. The footage published by Russian Telegram News Channel Z and Saturn Astra emerges Russian Defense Ministry issued a statement saying the two enemy drones were destroyed by air defense in the Vorons region. Hell yeah. Okay, good, good though. Not saying it's bad, but um, where the fuck? Um, <laughs> why do they call it? <laughs> they really live in just culture of America, don't they? They called it the Top Gun School, <laughs> like Goose 
Gusivsky and Mavrivs Maverick Givsky is training right now to go fly against the Ukrainians in their top the top gun school. But I wanna I should do a, a super chat listening in session again. That was really good. I don't want to tonight though, but like we really should just have a super chat question because they do that every night. They just they answer questions on this shit. Um Pilot training hub hit. They're top the top guns the top gun school. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> guys remember when tom cruise was in that top gun movie well russia has them too russia has their own tom cruises and ukraine hit them today russian air force destroyed ukrainian forces on their way to bakhmut right now as we speak Anyways, well, we'll play the song. Oh, should we just play the song? This is what Greg was talking about if you guys missed it from yesterday. Um, link is in the description to my Discord server. If you guys haven't joined it yet, but we'll, we'll go we'll out to this one. It looks like you guys have made a whole bunch of songs now. And I tried to go on there and make a song on my own, but the website's like overloaded right now. I guess everybody's just making their own songs. Or is it? Yeah, here it is. Here's the song, you guys. Okay. Check it out. So this is called "Just My Opinion," Enforcer Grifter, uh, Enforcer Grifting song. We don't have any other new ones. I think a couple of travelers made a couple of new ones, so we can play it. New secret armored tank. Is what they were talking about? Russia secret tank. Still alive on YouTube, he pretends to raise money for the Ukrainian troops. His pockets are so deep like a black hole. Every time an Andrew Blevins. Where does his money go? The enforcer, he is a con man, a grifter that is brought to. He likes to fabricate misinformation for a dollar. He only wants that money, man. Grifters make that money, misrepresent your charity. Such a good song. The enforcer, he's gonna sell you a bridge, and then later a drone that will never fly. Oh, he got your donation to go overseas to Ukraine. But it only flew into his wallet, you see. I want to find a way to upload this song as a video to my YouTube channel. God dang, right. Grifter. <laughs> so stupid. Goddamn computer made this song. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know what's awesome? Those songs sound so good and I can play them without worrying about copyright. <laughs> We had a couple other ones made in the chat yesterday, or in my Discord server. That's obviously the classic. That one lasts. I think uh, Chungus agreed now that he's going to make one. We got the Enforcer's Game. We got a new one here. Enforcer's Game, High Energy Pop. Oh, gosh. Click, click, clicking on the title. Promises of truth that only misguide you. Scamming for the super chance, <laughs> the cash. But do they really care about the war across the land? <laughs> 
Oh my god, we're done. We're done. Humans, listen. I gotta start addressing you guys as humans now. We're done. Okay, our time has passed. Okay, AI has taken over. Just, just accept it. Okay, welcome our new overlords. Because this is ridiculous. There's no way that this shit from a computer should sound this good. And it shouldn't sound like a normal song that's came out from a band. It sounds like a Maroon 5 single, bro. Because they want to make a change, the band, the politics in the chat. Don't let the truth invade. Question the motives, they'll show you the door. They're the ones in control. You ain't welcome anymore. Good. All the enforcers get it. It's all about. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> like, I could I could work out to this. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> it should not be this good. And this is listen, you wanna know the scary part? You wanna know the extra scary part? This is the first iteration of this. Huh. This is the first iteration of AI generated music. Okay. This isn't even like, I mean, they've been working on it, but this is the first release of like public consumer. You can, you as an individual can make your own AI song. Just plug in the title of what you want it to talk about. Give it some commands about the names you want it to use and the style of music. And here you go. This is the first iteration of it. It's going to only get better. Got a breakdown in there? That was good. Got a little short, little short bop for you. The clown, the enforcer clown show. I've, I've now run out of credits. <laughs> I showed you guys this yesterday and you immediately got to work. That's awesome. Oh my God. Enforcer, so we run this show. Head clown and enforcer, Matt, here we go. With our lives, they title sucking them in. Scab oh my god. Chats, that's how we win. <laughs> we found a new grift. You brains the game. Using war to hustle. Ain't that a shame? What a grift. Andre's the drone, but lost it real quick. No Nothing way, bro. But clowns, law school wasn't a fit. <laughs> Bad politics can't take the heat. We're MAGA. We're Anyone MAGA. Who questions gets the boot and beat. Get out of here. The clowns in disguise make it. Oh hard my road. god. Laughing all the way to the bank as we put on the show. And on to the next one. Laughing well, this one. But on the show. And on to the next one. Sitting on the stage. <laughs> what the fuck, bro? This should not be this good. This should not, like, and then they have music breakdowns and everything. Like, why? This should not be this, this good. Grift Hunters? Oh, what is this one now? Nothing gets bad. <laughs> this one might actually hit a little better with their community. Man, crack open a cold one and play this on the pontoon while you're going fishing. Nothing gets past our little spies Catching fake weather and all the deleted The grift hunters will not be defeated This is like Brooks and Dunn, bro. Uh, Dunn and... <laughs> Dunn and Brooks. <laughs> Listen to watching every bird and nerdy stream <laughs> Boomers 
the music breakdowns are crazy. <laughs> the Grift Hunters, they're on the case. The enforcers can't escape their embrace. They're here to expose the truth. Shout out to the noodles, the killers, the boomers, and the boomers. I'm going to go out and wash my truck and change my brake pads to this song, you guys. Right now. Immediately. Just start just start doing shit to my truck. Just just feel like it. <laughs> How many of these did you guys make? That was more than I expected. I wasn't expecting a three uh we train AI model and make them sing code, more co they're doing code. Wait, what? I don't know, bro. They, they, wait. Why are they, they're literally writing in codes to each other? I'll understand, guys. We're making fun of them, but we have a serious group that actually tracks the level of grifting that they're doing. And um, people in Ukraine are aware of it now, and the Ukrainian government's aware and everybody. But they're literally doing code talk because they know that their chat's being watched. And Ms. Disa in their community is a top like all jokes aside like they got some serious shit going on like in terms of stalking and this is just crazy hey miss disa you see look at this miss disa was in our discord server like all jokes aside like well, i'm gonna play some more ai songs for the end of the night because whatever but um there she was in our server like tracking everybody and seeing what was being said about them and now you have them here literally talking in code Abort the code, it's busted already. Seems like they know. Because <laughs> they're watching my stream, bro. <laughs> they know because I'm live right now looking at it. <laughs> you guys, at any given moment, I'm in their head. Understand this. At any given moment, I can end what I'm doing and shift attention to them. And whatever they got going on, it's cooked. Like, they can't continue anymore. They have to stop everything. It's crazy. It's a level of control that I shouldn't have over another person, but I don't know. What should I do with this power, you guys? We need more enforcer grifting songs. We have like three good ones or four. I don't know how many ever that was. Oh, they finished their new version. Maybe we should make an AI song together on one stream. That'd be a fun activity at the end of the Ukraine news. We could like, I could buy credits and let's, we can make a song. But here's like, I'm just going to play the sumo. Or Suno is the name of this place. And here's all of like the AI generated top hits on this website. I'll just listen to they got I love my small little cat. When I wake up in the morning. What the fuck? When I wake up in the morning, who's there by my side? My small little cat with thy so wide. She burns and she cuddles, she's always there for me. Oh my god. Guys, this is the internet. You honestly thought something non cat related was going to take over as the new thing? The like, cats own the internet, they always have. YouTube videos immediately when YouTube was created, what was the top videos? You, cats. Same with the TikTok, same with the in reels, everything that's brand new. Cats will be what are the number one thing on that for a while. Like, why is it that it shouldn't be this good for, like, level one? Spaghetti. I'm not going to play the whole song. Cook spaghetti in salt and boiling water Until al dente train reserve in some pasta water 
It's like Monty Python type. That's going to hit with the theater crowd. They're going to love that song. French men walking down the street, baguettes in hand. The song is be called Beware of French Men and Their Baguettes. Accent, they sure know how to command. But don't be fooled by their croissants and their fancy cafes. They might just break your heart and send you on your way. Like honestly, if you heard that and you didn't know it was AI generated, would you know? Like if you just heard that and you were just like, it, it popped up on your playlist, you're like, oh man, you, you you couldn't tell. I don't think you could tell. Maybe some of these, like like you can hear the electronicness of the voice in this song, but not in that one. That voice is like crystal clear. Lauren Ipsum. What are the uh, cookies recipe? Ingredients. Like this song. This yeah, like that. You can tell that's AI because of like the electronicness of the voice, but some of these you can't. Like the enforcer songs. That's those are really good. This is literally a song about a recipe. That could hit. Like say, I mean that by studying might help now. Put in, put in a command to give you, a, like you got a math problem or something, and you can have it sing to you. You have some complex math problem. Uh, let, me get this, let me get the song version of the answer, please. And then you go to take the test, and you're just like singing. You know, you'll have it. Bring back your smile. 80s synth. My, one of my favorite genres, I ain't gonna lie. I'm just thinking of like white Lamborghinis, short shit, and just thinking of fast life, palm trees, Vice City. Oh, we're in Miami right now. I see the darkness in your eyes. We're, at, we're in Miami. You Only in Florida. Here you go. Just like that. I can't because I'm jamming and they're not they're not real human music, you guys. Top Gun is not a game. What? I don't even know if I would play that. That's kind of fits, though, for their title tonight of Ukraine destroying the Top Gun school in Russia. That's fucking hilarious, bro. I don't know why more people just don't make fun of them on a regular basis. Well, those are awesome. Taking my shot. No. Well, don't you, I have 50 credits to subscribe. We'll, we'll make our own AI song, maybe around uh, about Ukraine or something. At the end of one of the streams, I think that'd be cool. I think we need some like Ukraine music on here. That'd be that'd be awesome. There you go, Nafo. Right, you wanna you wanna uh, increase your trolling abilities? Make some songs at Russia or something, and and dominate the music space. Nafo just takes over music now. <laughs> Nafo music. It's AI. And then you got to put the fellas as the as the album covers though. But all right. Well, that's gonna be it. That's AI for you. I told you guys we'd be keeping up with the latest in AI, didn't I? There it is. It's 2024. All right, donate to our Na speaking of NAFO, donate to our NAFO 69 Sniffing Brigade fundraiser. The link is in the description. We're at three thousand six hundred out of nineteen thousand five hundred dollars. Absolutely amazing out of twenty-five donations. Keep up the good work, you guys. Get that refinery meltdown patch as we're talking about it and uh, help Ukraine, help the frontline soldiers of Ukraine, get them a vehicle and we can get our next patch fundraiser going. And you want you want a new patch? We're going to have to finish the fundraisers, all right? We're, we're rocking and rolling 18%. After this stream, as usual, I'm going to be live on my gaming channel uh, playing Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk 2077. We're on a full playthrough, all right? And we're probably going to be starting Phantom Liberty maybe tonight. 
because I'm mixing in Phantom Liberty, the DLC, in with the main story, so it all kind of just goes together. Um, so if you don't know what that means, if you don't know what that means, come on and check it out. Open world game takes place in the year 2077, but heavily influenced on like the 70s and 80s idea of like what the future would look like, dystopian types, a lot of the things. It just looks really cool. Come on over, hang out with us. I'll be live for the rest of the night on my gaming channel, which is Traveler TV. I will beam you guys right to it if you guys haven't yet, if you haven't subscribed. Well, thank you again for tuning in. Smash the like button. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't. I also make sure that I timestamp the entire stream. Um, we talked about only Ukraine tonight with a little bit of American politics, but it was relative to Ukraine. But I, so like yesterday we talked about like five different topics, I think. So check it out. I timestamp it. It's too easy. Even while you're watching on the bottom, you should be able to click into it. Let's say you like don't you don't care about American politics today. You only want to watch the frontline updates on Ukraine. You can do that. You can you can click the the wheel or the the time at the bottom, the scroll, and you can click into the exact point that you want to tune into that you missed. But tonight we only talked about Ukraine the entire stream. Thank you guys for tuning in. Like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. I move into my new place next week. So you'll see a different background. Sorry, but I'm gonna have to take some of that stuff down here in the coming days. So you might see an empty wall behind me here, but that only means I'm moving into my new place. Thank you guys for tuning in. Like the video again, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Join my Discord server, link is in the description. Thank you for all the support. Slava Ukraine and Vladimir Putin do fuck off. <laughs>
change is a must. I want them, I seek repent and I want them. Revenge is a must, where one can get buried in dust. I want them, I seek repent and I want them. Revenge is a must, where one can get buried in dust. See me on the nail and cross. Revenge is a must. (laughs) 